from TMP to TTNG For sure the cure in those tired meme jeans Hella can sell in the promise ring Sunny day real estate and rights this spring Prince Twinkle Daddy's help keep the dream alive I constantly thank God for Algernon and Remo Christie front drive Mineral snowing high tide hotel a year and more Of the DC emotive hardcore, but you got it, man. Kyle and Ellie really on that emo bullshit. You got it. That is the official sound of episode 42 of the E-Word. Welcome. This is our 2019 end of the year episode. Uh, we did this in 2018 with the special guest, Tyler from Stars Hollow. And guess who's back? Tyler from Stars Hollow. Woo! Woo! <laughs> math, math rock band, woo. Woo! <laughs> Tyler, thanks for coming back for 2019. Um, we're going to do the same thing as last time, uh, top 10 albums of 2019, and then we're going to go into, uh, the official, our emo voting awards thing. Uh, that happened? I, I don't even think they did that this year. They haven't even launched it yet. We are launching it before them. Wait, okay. okay, cool. Um, <laughs> and we're going to talk about how our years were, what we're going to look forward to in 2020 and all that stuff. But yeah, so that's how it's going to start, but you know... We keep doing these long-ass podcasts, so we make our guests uh, plug their shit at the top. So, Tyler, Stars Hollow, what a year it's been for you. Today, It's been a cool year. Um, we just finished up a tour with Nice, which was really cool. You released that episode with Roddy mm -hmm. like while we were on tour, and I listened to it. And Roddy gave me some behind-the-scenes dish that I thought was wildly interesting that I'll talk to you about later. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so that tour was really, really cool. It was fun. Like, it's one of those things where we've like kind of like fizzled out on playing all the happy again stuff in Tadpole on tour, and I'm ready to like play a lot of new shit. So it was like cool to do that as like the last thing for the year and the last thing for happy again stuff. Um, we're finishing up LP1 right now. We just oh, have fuck. yeah, we have drums and bass done. Um, and so we have to do guitars and vocals now and then we'll be all done um the time okay I but like fucked on it but hear me out tyler yes do the do the guitar and vocals but also just like for fun release a drum and bass album <laughs> <laughs> avant-garde as hell everyone would be <laughs> thrilled it would get like an eight on pitchfork and everything would be okay it'd be fantastic um no, it's like going pretty well, and I'm pretty excited. Like, I feel really good about the songs, and Greg, who's recording it, he uh, he's been like really, really helpful in making it like as good as it can be. So that's been really sick. Yeah, we're gonna tour Japan in February. Oh, yeah. That's right. Wow. That's gonna be super sick. I'm like really excited about that. That's like, besides the LP, that's like the thing I'm most excited for, like ever in the world. So, um, so can I ask, like, how does a DIY band like? get to tour japan like um <laughs> a lot of a lot of luck um yeah. <laughs> so the the quote unquote company also known as person that booked this thing was uh it's called nothing feels real um it's run by this guy named kaisuke and he just like randomly reached out one day and was like hey i really liked your band ever since you put out your first ep and I'm interested in having you come to Japan, and I'll help you out with all the things that are difficult. 
Um, and at first when I got the email, I was like, this is a scam. They're like, no way. Like, they're <laughs> right. trying to kill us. And that's just how they're going to do it. They're going to pretend to get us to Japan and then they're going to kill us. That's basically what I thought. <laughs> and then I like read through the email and Kaiseki booked shows for like forests in Japan and stuff um, and sent videos of those shows and they looked really cool and it looked DIY. So I was like, okay, well, shit, cool. And Kaiseki was like, yeah, I'll take care of most of the stuff. You just come and all you have to bring are your guitars because like places in Japan just backline all the gear except for guitars. And so, yeah, so we're like set to go and Kaiseki's going to drive and rent a van and we're doing it with a band called Thirds from the Philippines. Um, oh, hell yeah. Which is really cool. They're a really good band. Yeah, I'm really excited. It's like, doesn't feel real yet, which is, you know, just because it's so wild. But it's been cool. And some of our other friends have started to get those same offers too, which I can't, I don't think I can say what friends have gotten those offers, but it's becoming more of a common thing, it seems like. So that's cool. Super cool. Yeah. Because so. I feel like when a band from Japan uh, comes to the United States, they like kind of get the same thing where it's like someone will set them up like a whole Midwest region of shows and kind of drive them around and make sure it's cool. Yeah, exactly. Cause that's um, the thing. Yeah. If we were kind of like left to our own shit over there, we would be like so fucked. Like yeah. there's just like, it's so different and none of us know any Japanese besides the like minor shit that I know from watching anime all the time in college. Like, like <laughs> relatively useless so and that's when you just say like good morning or like i'm so sorry i'm screwed you know but um but yeah so that's like pretty much all set up and that's kind of the only thing that we're like super focused on as far as touring right now so we're pretty like open after that for the rest of the year and we're just gonna put out the album and kind of feel things out so cool hell yeah kyle do you have anything to plug no not really Okay. I know that you do have stuff to plug. Oh, wait, hold on. Yes, we do. Um, people have been begging for this f since the podcast started. Uh, and we finally, I finally just did it. It took me three minutes. Uh, Spotify playlist. So every band that we mention substantially in any episode going forward, actually going since last episode, uh, we'll have a playlist on Spotify as to where all that music will be. Um, so it's easy. I thought it would be a huge chore no it took like three, <laughs> three minutes and while and while i'm editing i just have to write the band name down yo it's gonna be a fucking nightmare for you this episode just want to let you know correct <laughs> yeah oh yeah ellie's gonna say like 30 bands i've never heard of and i'm gonna <laughs> have to listen to the playlist so that's great um yeah. so that is linked in the link tree uh link that links to every place you could find stuff for the e-word so uh probably just check any bio for us on the internet and you'll find that playlist to go along with this episode and everyone going forward. All right. Uh, is it my turn to plug things? Yes. Do your thing. Okay. Yeah. So um, I am currently moving forward with trying to become self-employed. Um, and with that, I launched a Patreon for You Don't Need Maps. Um, I'm doing a weekly newsletter. The Signing up for the newsletter is free, but... If you go to my Patreon, patreon.com slash you don't need maps X and contribute $5 a month, you can request topics for me to discuss every week. And if you contribute $10 a month, I will make you a personalized Spotify mixtape every single month. Right now, the goal is to hit 150 and, and Patreon uh, subscribers a month, uh, and I will begin making YouTube videos. So if you need motivation for that, uh, here's just some shit off the top that uh, I would be making videos about. I want to do one about like skate videos and how skate videos have like impacted uh, the way that film is shot, the way that television is shot, and uh, just generally how much of an impact they had on me personally growing up. I'm going to do a video essay about uh, Jackass and how Jackass uh, came from skate culture and hardcore culture and how it has impacted pop culture at large. I'm going to do one about the ties between metalcore and screamo, um, how they intertwine the main in the mainstream, and uh, how that revival is coming back right now. Uh, I'm gonna do one about the Memphis hip hop and how it's the single most influential uh, hip hop scene on the current soundscape of hip hop. Um, so yeah, check it out. We got real fucking cool stuff coming down the pipeline for that. 
Also, uh, if you give me 20 bucks, I will do a band bio for you. And if you give me five bucks, I will roast your band. <laughs> charging for, I'm, I'm charging for that now because I'm too good at it to not charge for the services. That's fair. You got to know your worth. That's $20 for band bios seems like a very good value. That's it is. Uh, David Anthony was telling me people like charge fucking hundreds of dollars for that. And that blew my mind. I don't play like that, though, because... Also, if I truly don't like your band, I will give you your money back. I swear to God. <laughs> like, I thing. That's, a, that's a good uh, policy to have, I suppose. Yeah. Right. But, but my favorite part about you having an affordable band bio rate is that I won't see many band bios that are sad songs. Yes. Yes. So. Um, several people have already hit me up for it. Um, and so far, I have written the Commander Salamander band bio. And yep. I've also written a bio for a ridiculously good Screamo band called Snag. Oh, Snag um, from Milwaukee. They're so fucking absurdly good. And they are getting recognition now. And it's great. Yes. They are, they are incredible. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I will probably I'll write like two bios um, because I'll write a full one and then I'll do like condense it because the Spotify limit for band bios is like 1,499 characters, which is dumb. But yeah, slide into my DMs and we'll see what's up. All right. I'll drop that link somewhere for people to find that immediately while listening to this. But I think that's all for plugs, correct? Yeah. All right. Yeah. So the next on this episode is the big top 10 album of the year. So we're going to do honorable mentions at the end. I think we all probably have many. Um, and we're going to do this round robin style. So I'll go, Ellie will go, Tyler will go from 10 down to 1. Um, but yeah. first, some preliminary but, stuff. I was just going to say, I have also an EP list. Can I do that like at the top? Yeah. So I also wanted to ask, okay. how is everyone's list? Like, uh, you know, did you include EPs? Is there anything you want to say before, like, such as, I did not listen to this very obvious album that's not on my list type of thing? I just did EPs, like, in my honorable mentions, but I can, like, switch that and just do them at the top, honestly. Whatever works. Um, this year was a fucking embarrassment of riches for music. Uh, like, <laughs> last year and most of this year, I felt like I was kind of, like, slowly sliding out of being invested in DIY. And when I was writing this list, I was like, wait, shit, no. I'm so excited for music right now. Like, there's so much amazing shit happening. I kept thinking this as the year was going on. I was like, okay, when is like that, when are these hot albums gonna come out? And then I feel like this fall finally had like a lot of things that I was interested in. But I think it's something that has to do with me getting older and like, not dedicating like my whole day to not paying attention to the work and listening to music instead of paying attention to work and not even realizing there's music playing in my headphones. Um, so I feel like I spent most of this year just listening to like Longmont Potion Castle al albums and like podcasts and not giving shit about, about music as much as I usually do. But I think at the end of the year, I was like, okay, I liked a lot of albums and I didn't love a lot of albums. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I'm not as jaded as I'm afraid of being. <laughs> I think Word. I'm like 20 times Good. more jaded than I'm afraid of being, honestly. <laughs> like, I, like, I, like it, I think it doesn't help that like on tour, that's like what we do is listen to music for like just hours on end, like on the way to gigs. And then we get to the gig and then we listen to more music and then someone plays music between the bands. So I think that that like kind of like caught up with me this year. Um, in the sense that, like, I just don't like loud things as much as I used to, I've noticed. I just feel like I'm, like, 40 years old for saying that. But, yeah, I think it was, like, like the records that I liked this year, I liked a lot. But I just, like, don't have as much energy as I used to to, like, pour into listening to everything possible. When I find something that I like, it's almost, like, cooler because it's, like, oh, shit, like, this stands out a lot compared to everything else. And I'm not, like, annoyed by its existence. So that's always good. Mm -hmm. I thought that this was a step back in terms of emo records that I liked. I don't think there were as yeah, many this year. Yeah, I was going to say this year was shit for emo. I feel like the emo that I liked were bands that I'm, like, friends with. Yes. And yes. they were, like, bands that are, like, around the same level as Stars Hollow or, like, got, like, blown up from that level. 
but yeah as far as like bigger bands that i've like always looked up to or that i've always really liked there's nothing that i'm i was like floored by really one of the our email categories is best new email artists and all the ones i was thinking of that were new were actually bands from last year that i finally listened to this year like you know like jail socks and uh bands on that level which is basically yeah. like the stars mm-hmm. Hollow level mm-hmm. um exactly what what else it was a decent year for hip-hop yes uh, Ellie, you also put this in my ear too, and I agree 100 percent this was an absurd year for hardcore. There were so incredible. Many... Yeah. Incredible yeah. Year for hardcore. I, I thought it was a good year for indie rock too. Yeah, I'd say so. Honestly. There's there's none on my list, but maybe, <laughs> sure. <laughs> I don't know. I just feel like I'm getting old. That's like looking at my like, like weird because my list looks like it belongs to like a 17 year old. But I also just like don't like that many things, so that's just all all that I'm feeling. God, Tyler's gonna have Taylor Swift in his list. I don't <laughs> actually. That's I should have thought of that, but I didn't. Do you do you have Lizzo though? No, I don't have Lizzo. Mm-hmm. I I guarantee I know for a fact one of your albums like yeah. already. Me, I'm me, sure you me, do. Uh, but we'll talk about it later. Don't you worry. We'll talk about it. We'll talk about it. Later for sure. I have a lot to say. Don't don't you worry. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so y'all want to rattle off some EPs then? Yeah. yeah. I actually have one EP on my list, and then I would just like to shout out all of the Commander Salamander EPs and all of the uh, the Origami Angel EPs, and that's uh, and I love the Jail Socks EP too. I didn't write these down, but off the top of my head, those were the EPs that really stuck with me. Also, oh, the yeah. the future EP was really good too. So a couple runners up before I get into the, the top ten EPs, which are in no particular order. Um, really love the the two songs, the Shin Guard for Your Health Split, Death Spring. Um, Wings of Kynaris put out a promo uh, this year that is like DIY lo-fi deathcore, and it's fucking dope. Um, Method of Doubts, Accepting What We Know, which kind of sounds like Crown of Thorns in 2019, like like crushing like 90s new york hardcore with like a melodic edge shadow marks by lord snow insane screamo record with insane guitar work uh the slow goers ever home really pleasant and i guess this would be the one indie rock album on my <laughs> on my list um origami angel gen 3 and holy split of course all right and then Top 10 EPs. Anxious, never better. This band is the closest Super thing good. that we are getting to a title fight reunion. Yep. Yep. Insane. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, one step closer for me to you. Uh, this record reminds me a lot of kind of that that strain of 90s emo core that was very indebted to Turning Point. Yep. Uh, but a bit more cr- like crunchy and moshy, but fantastic. Super sing alongable. Uh, binary, say your prayers, no one cares. Metalcore Screamo on top. Hell yeah. Uh, Life's Question, A Tale of Sudden Love and Unforgettable Heartbreak. Uh, just not exactly fun like in subject matter, but fun to listen to. Lurk, Electroshock. Are either of you familiar with the band Lurk? I don't think so. Just seen the name on flyers and stuff. All right. Imagine Devo playing hardcore. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of sick. <laughs> it's fucking great. All right. Um, portrayal of guilt, suffering is a gift, and is becoming a real fucking force to be reckoned with. And also, Austin represent inclination when fear turns to confidence. Uh, extremely stupid lyrics, but that's <laughs> fine because the music is also extremely ignorant. Like it matches pretty well, and the guitar tone just keeps getting better and better every release. Commander Salamander off the goop. I think this is so far that band's absolute peak songwriting. And performance, like, everyone sounds fucking incredible on this record, but I do want to give a special shout-out to Liam, who might actually be, like, the best drummer in the emo game right now. Just not calculated at all, but ADHD and so much personality. Uh, So with that... Uh, so without September 13th, 2017. This is a Las Vegas screamo band. Um, they don't play straightforward Screamo as much as they play, like, weird kind of experimental progressive Screamo, uh, but it is extremely heavy, and the production is shit, but it works perfectly. And finally, Katie, Silence Will Not Protect You. Uh, this is a UK band. 
more screamo, but mixed with like really aggressive, uh, kind of beat downy hardcore. Um, it sounds weird in theory, but in practice, it works excellently. Really passionate lyrics um, and incredible performances. And that's it. I could just listen to you talk about music all day. People better just like support the fuck out of that Patreon because I just want to. I just want to <laughs> well, hear shit. that. Uh, thank you so much. That means like the world to me. I'm glad. Please don't make me cry this early in the podcast. That's for later. <laughs> we'll we'll get there. Um, mine, uh, never better by Nice. Um, Love handles is like my favorite EP of the year. Um, song of the year, excuse me. Uh, that song just like. We played with Nice like before they were a three piece, and I remember watching them and be like, "Okay, yeah, that's a band." And then they put out Love Handles, and I was just like 100% on board. And that whole EP just rips, and people fuck so hard with them now, and it's like really cool to see Gami both Gen Three and Holy Split, always amazing. Ryland cannot write a bad song. Um, <laughs> it's not Forever by Jail Socks. Uh, that shit made me feel like I was like 18 again. Oh yeah, super wild shit. Like I just literally would listen to it, and I just like felt like my girlfriend had just broken up with me, and like I was skateboarding <laughs> around my hometown eating gummy worms, and just like very nostalgic sound while also being like really, really fresh. The Love Worm EP by Biba Doobie. I think that's how you say that. I I just listened to her music a shit ton on Spotify, but like I'm not really actively involved in her fan base or anything but um there were some really cool songs on that uh off the goop commander salamander that's i agree that's like the best collection of songs they've done so far especially scooter razor scooter that mm-hmm. song is scooter i love cupcake too cupcakes really good yeah really cool let's see magical by equipment um equipment's like a band that i saw around a shit ton but i never ever listened to them or gave them a chance but um that EP has some really good songs on it. And then Good Sleepy, they put out an EP this year that sounds like exactly like the year 2011. I Hell yeah. Especially for like the age that they are. We met them on this last tour with Nice and uh, they're like 17, 18. And I'd be talking to them and I'd just be like, damn, I'm like almost 10 years older than you people. Yeah. And you're writing like super good emo that sounds like it's from 2011, which is like sick as hell. So yeah, those are those are my favorite EPs. All right, so we're on to number ten on our end of the year list. Y'all mind if I start? Keep it simple. Yeah, yeah. go All right. for it. My number ten is a soul record. It's by a band called Duran Jones and the Indications. The album is called American Love Call. It came out this winter. I don't listen to much neo soul and like that Charles Bradley shit I think is cool. I never listen to it, it never sticks with me, but um this band played the venue that I work for. I was playing the record and it just stuck with me all year. It's got really really like smart lyrics for soul like it they're 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 political. Um it talks a lot about social commentary and stuff. Um they're from Indianapolis, cool Midwest band. I don't think there's any like there's no like this this is just purely like lives in the world of soul and like it's not like it doesn't like step into like indie rock or anything like that and um i don't know like it sounds like this shit that would play at like the the grocery store that i worked at in in fucking high school and like i don't know why it it just wouldn't leave my ears this year so um i don't think people listen to this podcast will like it but it's gonna be on the playlist so give it a shot if you want hell yeah yeah hell yeah um oh shit it's my turn yeah <laughs> <laughs> all right uh my number 10 is the album crush on me by the artist sir baby girl so my friend rosa who is in a band called clavel uh which is very good screamo but i don't think they put anything out this year so sorry um uh they sent this to me and said hey this person used to be in some hardcore bands so you'll probably enjoy this and I hate that that is always accurate because I love the fuck out of this album. Uh, so essentially, Sir Baby Girl is this person who used to be in some Boston hardcore bands. Um, and now they play Carly Rae Jepsen-esque pop music. And it's really good, uh, extremely gay lyrics, extremely gay energy. And the thing I really like about this album is a lot of pop albums will kind of 
have this thing they fall into where they're like, okay, we need to take the energy level down a notch, put in a ballad or whatever. This album has zero pretensions towards that. It's just fun and exuberant and like bursting with energy all the way through. So I know for a fact almost everybody who listens to this podcast loves Carly Rae Jepsen. If you love Carly Rae Jepsen, please check out Sir Baby Girl. Um, cool, my turn. Uh, my number 10 is Good at Falling by the Japanese House. I really, really like the Japanese house a lot. It's just like the perfect like feeling of like 1980s pop, but just like drenched in reverb and just like cool vocal effects. I listened to all of their EPs and really liked them. This is my number 10, but I was like a little disappointed in just like the energy of the whole record. I was hoping it'd be a little bit more like groovy. It was a little bit more somber than I expected it to be, but it's really good there was a redone version of another song that they did called saw you in a dream which was like my favorite song last year and the year before and that rendition is really really cool songwriting is pretty cohesive you're never like kind of caught off guard by anything but it's not in a boring way really yeah it's just really good record and if you're into like the 1975 but want it to be a little less peppy the japanese (laughs) house is pretty good uh pretty good replacement for that word sweet i gotta i gotta check that out because i hate the 1975 but <laughs> a band that a band that takes like what they generally do and is good s- seems to be right up my alley yeah she um her voice is really really cool and the way that they use effects really cool and she also plays a guitar upside down like not restrung literally just takes a right-handed guitar and flips it to be left-handed and plays it upside down um and I think that's the coolest shit ever, too. So, I mean, if you ever need more reasons, there's more reasons. You know? Kurt Cobain did that. He was right-handed, but deliberately, deliberately played left-handed guitar to get, like, a more messy sound. Damn. So, in a, in a great rock tradition. Yeah. Great rock tradition. Fantastic. Is this, like, a big band? Because I feel like the way that people love them is kind of, like, as if they're, like, like kind of, like, a secret. But I f- feel like they play they're big, like big, bigger rooms. Yeah, they're like a really unwell kept secret, I guess. Like, um, they they probably play like five hundred cap rooms at least. I bet. Yeah. And most of the U.S. Um, and I'm, they opened for the nineteen seventy five on a couple tours, and those were like arena tours, like really big, play, like Red Rocks Amphitheater type of things. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, so I mean, like they're not like super secret, but they're definitely the type of band where people would think that they're cool for knowing who they are, you know, like mm. they, they sound like no one would like them and that they'd be indie. It's like, it was playing <laughs> urban outfitters, like urban outfitters would have this going over the speakers and people would be like, Oh my God, I can't believe they're playing this band kind of thing. So word. It's amazing how you managed to turn that into like an anti advertisement. Like that sounds <laughs> like the worst thing. <laughs> they definitely have that vibe about them, which is fine. But you know, all right, on to number nines. My number nine is Diva Sweetly in the Living Room. This was a January release. Um, I believe this is like half of Pictures of Vernon and um, indie, kind of slackery, kind of like weasery at the same time, kind of very like shimmery. Also, it's just kind of like a soup of lots of emo things, but I think like the the main line through the whole thing is that it's catchy and melodic as hell. Um, this album like came out in January, and I was like, this is going to be perfect when the snow melts, and it was perfect when the snow melts, and I'm still listening to it. Um, I, I I don't know much about this band, and like I know I know that they toured with like the Wonder Years this summer, um, and they're on Seal Mountain Records, which is which started to release the Unihan mixtape and it's still like signing some bands here and there. Um, but yeah, I feel like, I feel like people kind of forgot about this record cause it came out so long ago, but I remember when it came out, there was a lot of hype around it. Yeah. I don't know if anyone here has listened to this album. I think it was Gavin on tour would ask to listen to this while we were driving back in the summer. Uh-huh. And I remember I had never heard of it and I thought it was really, really cool. And it's one of those things where it's like, I don't know why I didn't listen to it more. Because when I think back to it, I remember being like, oh, this record's like super cool. The context of where I was hearing it, I think on tour, just like around music constantly, like Mm -hmm. might have just got lost in my brain. But it's a good record. Really, really good. Yeah, Mm. it's it's surprising because like it's it's totally like all 
DIY. I mean, like it's pictures of Vernon. It's this like uh, it's this DIY label, and um, but like it sounds like the way it sounds, it like it could be like total indie darling, like put out on like Dead Oceans or something. So it's like cool that you know all these punk and emo kids are coming together making something that sounds like this um but yeah there's always a record on my list that sounds exactly like weezer and there's a lot of weezer vibes on here so <laughs> fulfills that one okay number nine freddie gibbs and mad lib bandana uh i think <laughs> what? sorry keep going i just that was a wild ride of a name continue <laughs> well what do you what do you mean it's freddie gibbs and then it's also mad lib and they put an album together and it's called bandana I think I think in my brain it, it was Freddie Gibbs and the Mad Libs. Oh <laughs> shit! <laughs> it's like it's honestly the most fucking a wild ride. Better name. <laughs> Continue. I'm okay. sorry, I was just floored by that. If any of our hip hop heads who listen are familiar with Freddie Gibbs and Mad Lib, they put out an album a couple years ago called Pinata, which is in contention for my favorite hip hop album of the entire decade. But when Bandana came out, I remember listening to it and thinking, oh, shit, I think they topped themselves. Like, just the way that Mad Lib can kind of incorporate that with uh, uh, extremely modern production styles in a way that feels sleek and uh, not at all corny or forced. That that soundscape, when, when you listen to it, just fits the way that Freddie Gibbs raps so perfectly. Because... Uh, he has a honestly incredible rhyming style. His cadence is untouchable. Um, his subject matter, which veers from like braggadocio to extremely personal without skipping a beat, um, just really, really hits home for me. And if you like hip hop at all and you haven't listened to this album this year, you are fucking up hard. I need to listen to more hip hop. I feel like I'm always like so behind the curve on that shit. Like all that Roddy talked about on tour was like he was like, "Yo, you heard of the baby?" And I'm like, "No, I haven't <laughs> listened to the baby." <laughs> he's, like, he's like, "Yo, have you listened to Comethazine?" And I'm like, "No, I have not listened to Comethazine." <laughs> and I'm like, "I kind of want to, but it's like I just feel so behind the curve." So I'll have to listen to that. I've always been a big hip hop head, so. I, if I didn't have hip hop in my top 10 list of the year, I feel like I really f fucked up and fell behind. It, but it is like a very current music genre. Like it's mm -hmm. like it's easy to fall into the trap of being like, oh, these classics from when I first got into it are all I really need. But like literally genre exploding albums come out every single month in this in this genre. And I think it's at like an artistic peak right now which is insane because it's been at an artistic peak for like the last 20 years straight. It just keeps getting better and more interesting. I'll have to, I need to like join the subreddit for hip hop heads and just like keep up on it. <laughs> you might not want to do that. <laughs> yeah. <though. laughs> yeah that's uh, good? That subreddit's a little rough. <laughs> is it? Okay. I'll keep, I'll keep my distance then. Um, the hip hop heads literally is just that meme of like, white kids sitting behind the computer like yo 6 9 is fucking up man i would never roll on my homies on gang it's like, a, <laughs> Holy shit. A, it's like a 10 year old kid wearing glasses <laughs> yeah we don't we don't need that i suppose i'll i'll steer clear then i'll uh i'll find other channels you had brock um, hampton on your list last year right or am i making yeah, that up I, yeah yeah i did yeah i'm a, i fuck with brock hampton real heavy yeah we'll we'll get to that later but right now oh, okay my my number nine is Breakup Season by Future Teens. When I first heard this record, I kind of struggled with it a little bit. Um, I thought that there were really, really good hooks and really cool parts. There were songs that sounded straight up like they were Brad Paisley songs, but with like <laughs> more of a punk beat to it. And like and it felt like I don't know, it felt like a different rendition of like farm emo. Like I felt like I was listening <laughs> to like people tapping spoons on the porch kind of shit instead of like sad honky tonk stuff my main struggle with the record at first was just kind of like the lyrics because everyone in future teens is older than i am and so like just lyrically i didn't really identify with like the whole like tinder struggle and the like relationship sadness stuff that just kind of felt like teenage stuff but like I kind of got past that and was just like these songs bang like the lyrics are well written. It's just like the subject matter just feels weird contextually. 
it's I don't know, it's a really good record. I appreciated like how well written it was, how well it flowed. They really do the multiple vocalist thing really well to yeah. where it like balances the record out insanely well. It doesn't feel like it's like one person is better than the other. They just like have very complimentary writing styles. Yeah, just a very good record. And I didn't think they'd really be able to top their first record. And I think this like is at least up there with it. Can I just say I'm really enjoying how diverse our lists already are? Yeah. In- insanely diverse. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like we're two we're two steps into this top ten already, like six extremely <laughs> wildly varying albums have been named. Yeah. Like that's cool. That just speaks to what I was saying earlier. This year was an embarrassment of riches. Exactly. I will add that, like, I listened to Breakup Season the day it came out, and I unfortunately got pulled away and haven't listened to it since. But um, I do love that. And I feel like maybe Emo misses this, that, like, multiple songwriters within the band thing, like, that's such an underrated mm-hmm. thing. Like, it, it is so great in, like, punk rock. You know, like, the Lawrence Arms was a classic example of that, Chris. Literally that, was yeah. just about to mention the and Lawrence Brandon, Arms. Yeah. Brandon, Cale. yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. Future Teens Rule. I did not listen to them until this year. And I saw them like three times this year and such a good band. All right. Number eight, my basic indie rock kid pick, Sandy Alex G, House of Sugar. I think Alex is one of the best songwriters currently uh, in music. Um, I know that is not an original take. Everyone will say that. Um, But I have been a fan of his for half of this decade. And I think Alex has like maybe three songs that I don't like at all and he has like a million songs and i was waiting for him to fuck up with this record and i know like all these songs are amazing i think southern sky is like a top five alex g song the thing that i love about the alex g catalog is every album i'm just like what the fuck is this one gonna sound like next and this one i think was the least surprising i think like you know one song he he sings in like a country western like style like he sounds like a hick singing um i feel like that's like as wild as it gets like there's not what's the song brick where it's like a death grip song in the middle of the last album um this one's a little more controlled and i think that is for the better i i just i'm constantly amazed by alex and i know people online kind of make fun of people that like alex g now because it's like wow a guy pitch shifted his voice up and indie kids are just jizzing all (laughs) jizzing all over it and like um i don't know i'm not like wave riding i really fucking love alex g and i think house of sugar is uh probably like in the middle of like my favorite alex g records but dude just hasn't slipped up yet and that's really impressive I don't think I've ever heard you say the word jizzin before, and <laughs> I I, can I, stop I think want. that I really don't like it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I I'm happy for you that you like Alex G. This yeah, isn't a it's, time or place. Not a thing. This isn't a time or place for me to shit on it. No. Um, my number eight is "This World Is Too Much" by Restraining Order. Um, I feel like this year in hardcore was a year of people going more to uh, more to hard or more to heavy um and restraining order i wouldn't quite say that it's like 80s core because that's a little reductive and it doesn't really speak to uh the energy and passion and creativity that they bring to these songs but it, it does remind me a lot of like late 80s hardcore when it was going through the growing pains of reinventing itself and uh, was trying to feel excited about itself again. This record is banger from start to finish. Um, Extremely good, angry, passionate lyrics. Uh, There are a couple hardcore albums above it on my list just because of like overall consistency. But I will say the title track of this album is my favorite hardcore song of the year. Reminds me a lot of like Roner Park era ceremony. And yeah, that's it. Is this a triple B band? Uh, yes, I believe so. Aren't they all? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My number eight is Immunity by Claro. Um, I fucking love Claro so much. I used to see shit on Twitter. People would be like, fuck Claro. And I'd be like, why? <laughs> and they'd be like, because Claro's an industry plant. And I was like, okay. 
And then I checked Claro out and I was like, this is the sickest industry plan I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> I'm going to listen to this every single day. Because it's just like one of those things where like, as long as you're not like a white guy, I don't care if you're an industry plant. Like, there's just sick. But like, there's just like, you can bleep can this out. I'm not sure if we I need should to make, say. It. No, we need to make that the title of this episode. <laughs> if, as long as you're a white guy, I don't care that you're an industry plant. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's true because it's like you know how many advantages do you really like need. You know exactly. Exactly. And um, and that's what that was my big thing with Sarah was I was like I don't care, you know that um that she might be an industry plant because she rips and this album was really good because it got a little bit more guitar focused got a lot less electronic than her past stuff i think someone from vampire weekend might have produced it so i listened to some podcast about it and it was like really cool to listen to like how the songwriting went down but it's just really good it's got really tasteful synth parts where there needs to be um the lyrics are like a little more mature than things that she's done in the past which is really cool yeah, it's just like a really easy record to listen to, and you can either listen attentively and get a lot out of it, or if you just put it on as background noise, it's good for either one. It's just like really, really chill, but really interesting. Yeah, I, I back Claro. I, I back Industry Plants. If it's giving me the shit that I need, I want it, you know? So, Why does everyone think that Claro's an, an Industry Plant? I think because she kind of came out of nowhere for one and two, I think her parents are like rich or are involved in the industry somehow. Uh, um, yeah, I didn't look too deep into it. I just kind of saw some people say that on the internet that I don't really care about their opinions anyway. And so I was like, <laughs> uh, they don't know what the fuck they're talking about. So even if she is an industry plant, 10 out of 10. Great industry plant. The two things I know about her is her one song that was like, a related video for any indie rock video on YouTube forever. Uh, Pretty Girl? Is that the name of it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Uh, I watched her Nardwar thing, and she's just been uploading covers to YouTube forever, so it's not like she came out of thin air. I mean, wasn't Justin Bieber discovered on YouTube? Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's yeah. not an industry plant. I think, I think like, that's the thing. People don't know what an industry plant means. Yeah, yes, that is 100% yes. correct. Yeah, I don't think people get the concept that a real industry plant would be like a room full of people that do marketing and stuff being like, okay, this is what we need this person to look like and then blah, 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 and then creating that. But like, yeah, I, yeah, Claro's I like, will say, I will say, I don't think this happened in Claro's case specifically, but I do think there are examples of artists who were DIY and then were turned into industry plants via that process you were talking about. Mm -hmm. so, Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. I could definitely see that. Just being yeah. like, especially I feel like mid mid two thousands, early twenty tens. I feel like that was yeah. a bit more yeah. prevalent. And I mean, I probably have another band on this list that could fall under that too. But we can talk about that later, also. All right, into number eights, number sevens. I mean, Wicca Phase brings Eternal Suffer on. God damn! Oh, this is high. <laughs> yeah i love this record um i have flirted with trying to get into uh emo trap for like the whole existence of this podcast basically since yes, ellie and i started that's started, that's started talking um <laughs> and uh you know seeing i mean little peeps death and this coming out like three months later or something like that i feel like i feel like this is the album that needed to come out like just to kind of prove that like emo trap is like something that can be like bigger than just just like an image you know is that is yeah. that is that like a weird way to put it because yeah um i see what you're saying i if i can interject just real quick mm -hmm. i do think that emo rap as a genre is going to survive but with little peep dead and x dead and now juice world dead and then a lot of the other purveyors of that kind of scene in jail. I think SoundCloud rap is is dead. And I think its influence is going to reverberate and disperse throughout pop music because we have never ever seen like a DIY music movement have the commercial success that this one did. Mm -hmm. um, so I do think that subsets of it, such as emo rap, will continue to to have a big impact, especially with like Ghostman getting signed to Triple B or Little Lotus getting signed to Epitaph. Jesus yeah, Christ. that happened this week. <laughs> I, I do think that's going to still happen, but SoundCloud rap itself is, like, dead now. 
I think what I was trying to say, though, is, like, this is, like, very, very, very meticulously, like, recorded and thought out and stuff. And I don't know if they're, like, like, Ellie, I guess, just so we can converse on this, like, is there, <laughs> is there someone that has recorded an album that has, like, or in the genre that has, like, the instrumentation that this has and stuff like that? I mean, like, like in studio instrumentation, not like previously sampled. Yeah. Um, McCafferty, obviously. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was just thinking about that. Actually, uh, Lil Peep's studio debut. Um, all those, all those instrumentals were composed. Okay. Like, um, and that kind of is the case with like a lot of this stuff. Um, especially like stuff that Omen Thirteen is doing. Yeah, it's not it's not that unique, but I do think that Sufferon took it to a little bit more of like a like you said, meticulously constructed level. Yeah. People that are kind of on the fence about emo traps such as myself, like I think like this one did break through and like kind of made people uh come around and not just think that it's all just like face tattoos and old hot topic shirts and stuff like that. Like I think like <laughs> I, I I think, like, this album did, like, break through to a lot of people that were on the fence, and I think that's cool. Um, and... Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I'm I'm very surprised how, like, how good this album is. Yeah. I'm gonna see what cafe is on Sunday. With Anxious. Hell yeah. That's I, gonna be such a sick show. Mm -hmm. I want to, like, Wicca phase so bad. Like, it just seems like something I should love. And I don't know what it is about it, but I just can't can't do it and i don't know why um, like, um i think it's his voice i think because i like other emo trap artists like a bit more but like i think it's just the what his vocal delivery for some reason just like doesn't sit with me yeah i think uh adam's vocals are kind of like a a block when getting into wicca phase because it almost sounds like it shouldn't like connect with the music um I think a good starting point to get into him would be probably the single he put out earlier with Georgia Mac. Um, I think that is oh, yeah. like some of the catchiest stuff he's ever done. That's not even and on the album. Also, uh, also, of course, Absolute and Doubt. I think he's amazing on that song. I'll have to check those out because, yeah, I want to like it. It just seems like I should. I just, yeah, just can't. Uh, also, Will Yet produced this album. So, hello. Oh, shit, that's cool. Ellie do do doesn't hate every Will Yip album. <laughs> That's, that is true. Uh, all right. Uh, is it my turn? Yes. Mm -hmm. Number seven, Denzel Curry, Zoo. I don't think I have wanted to, like, jump up in the middle of the bus and start punching people more than when I listen to Ricky. Uh, uh, this is... I mean, Denzel just has, like... a really natural talent for making like hyperactive bangers like that just like reach into the parts of your body that want to dance and pulling the strings but it it is so consistent on zoo that i i feel like putting it under uh bandana would be doing kind of like a disservice to how much i truly love this album this year because lyrically i don't think it, it it is as good as bandana um just the the charisma dripping out of every single song on this album is undeniable. Uh, highly recommended. Oh, yeah. My number seven is Basking in the Glow by Oso Oso. Um, whenever I put that record on, it feels like I'm listening to the radio in the 90s. I could literally... Hell yeah. Oso Oso touring with, like, Hootie and the Blowfish and Bare Naked Ladies or something. Like, just... Like, they just have that really, really clean catchy sound that's really easy to get into i don't think i like this record as much as i like unahan um but i got really attached to unahan and that was all that i listened to for like a while this one had really catchy songs it's really cool to see how like big oso oso is getting um they keep getting on really cool end of the year lists like billboard and crazy stuff that you wouldn't even imagine and uh getting on big tours like they're with manchester orchestra right now i'm pretty sure mm -hmm. um Mm. and those rooms looked like really packed and i saw like a video of them playing and the crowd looked like super super boring pretty sure all those people are like 35 to 40 years old if they're manchester fans so it's not really a good good show but um but yeah really good album really good really good delivery i liked it a lot all right 
number six records. Mine is Club Night with their album What Life. Uh, this was a Tiny Engines release, and I couldn't think of a band that maybe sounds more like a Tiny Engines band just because it teeters that emo and indie thing kind of perfectly. This, this album kind of sounds like blog rock in 2019. Like, uh, <laughs> that's the yeah, shit, that makes perfect sense. That's the shit that I, when I was 17, I was listening to blog rock because, you know, that's what I was downloading and on, on legal websites and stuff like that. And this really kind of reminds me of that and kind of like bands kind of like Architecture and Helsinki and the Shy or however you pronounce that band. But like there's also like a lot of points that kind of make me hear like the world is in this band. And I don't know, it just kind of seems like it was made for me in so many ways. Um, didn't really pick up many reviews or much hype or, you know, buzz or anything, but... um just seeing like the four fans of whenever I saw this album, I just had to click on it and um, really, really great record. Uh, don't know what, I mean, I feel so bad because Tiny Engines just kind of soured their whole life. And I like, I don't feel sorry for them, but I just feel sorry for the bands. Like I DM the band on Instagram. I was like, can I buy my record directly from you? I don't know. I just feel so bad. Like those, like those bands don't get their albums like promoted now because the label went away word all right number six are y'all ready this is right before the top five this just missed the top five shit and guard 2020 the state of screamo in 2019 is really interesting because although it never really went away um it has been picking up more mainstream attention due to the fact that people who grew up listening to screamo are now finally in like a tastemaker position and I'm really glad about that because that means that perhaps Shin Guard will become as big as Code Orange. Uh, and they fucking deserve it because this, uh, the, this album is like Pittsburgh metalcore mixed with like the fall of Troy, mixed with straightforward screamo, mixed with like this extremely accessible pop sensibility uh, that I don't think any band before or since has really touched. And just listen to Kennedy. Just listen to that song, please. That, I'm begging you. Rips so hard. <laughs> yeah. So also, the finale of this album, you will be held accountable for your actions. Uh, I I feel like anyone who has had a friend who really fucked them over and the friend group did nothing about it uh, will benefit from listening to that song. Because it really just, like taps into that altogether amazing fucking album and i can't wait to see like what big things are in store for shin guard mm -hmm. yeah they're gonna do really cool shit i bet they're just like the perfect screamo band honestly and and they're so goddamn young it's infuriating <laughs> <laughs> um let's see my number six is routine maintenance by aaron west in the roaring 20s i am a fucking sucker for albums that are fictional if they're well written and i really mm -hmm. really loved the first aaron west album i think that it's partially like getting into my mid-20s i can identify more with someone who's dealing with like divorce and abortion than not someone who's like why won't you love me back you know that kind of thing. <laughs> um, and I, I just realized that sounds like a shot at foxing i really like foxing <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> anyway, um, yeah i totally thought that was a dunk <laughs> no, I, like, I like boxing it's yeah no um but this album is just like super super well written in the context of being like a sequel to the first record um in terms of storyline it's a lot about like being a better person for people who care about you and for yourself and i think that that's like a really really it just really resonated with me this year um and that's just kind of like what's a lot of what stars hollows lp is about it's just that concept and i think that writing what i was writing and kind of just like hearing that record just it really stuck with me and there's just a good spread of just like highway jam bangers and like really soft delicate songwriting and at this point i i like this record better than i like the last wonder years record i wouldn't be surprised if that continues to kind of be a trend with the way that that's going but yeah routine maintenance really really good record word um i will continue to maintain that it is not uh the time or the place for me to express dissenting opinions 
<laughs> did you before we move on? Did you just, did you really like the newest Wonder Years record? Um, no, I fucking hated the last Wonder Years record. Uh, I thought it sounded like adult contemporary Foo Fighters, like just garbage. But also, I have never liked Aaron West in the Roaring Twenties. I find his shtick like unbearably precious. <laughs> um, and it's, it's really, a, it's really a shame because like taken as, like taken as they are, everything the Wonder Years did up to No Closer to Heaven, like up to and including No Closer to Heaven, I should say, uh, puts them in like my top five bands of all time. Oh, yeah. I, I adore all that material, but I don't know. I don't know what's going on. I feel like, uh, as soon as, as soon as Dan stopped writing lyrics, like directly from his diary, um, like, this is what I did today. Uh, it, it stopped having that, like, real intimate feeling that I associated with them. That's fair. I think that's all fair. On to Top the second. Fives. We're in the second half. Top five. Number five right now. Mine is Mannequin Pussy with their album Patience. Uh, I've never listened to this band before this album. I know that they were, because they were a Tiny Engines band, uh, I've always lumped them into the emo world, um, but one of the most vivid memories I'll have this year is when one of my bands went on tour, someone put this album on and the band just like got silent and everyone was just kind of like engrossed in this record. And um, the van wasn't like that for the entire tour. Um, so like this album just like kind of came across, everyone was like, oh fuck, this is like really good. And like, it's such an intense record that like, I remember like after it, everyone was like, Oh, did you get chills during that one song? And everyone's like, yeah, and stuff like that. Um, so like this album is gigantic um, sounding. It's it's kind of like it's kind of dinosaur junior y at some points. And then like there's like a track that's like under a minute long. It's just like a punk banger. I think like some of the headlines are um, kind of like this being like a gigantic, like bad relationship record and stuff like that. Um, very shocked that this is on my list just because I had never listened to this band before and just it, I just never thought it was like something that I would be into but yeah this album just like hits really fucking hard so uh, I recommend it it's a Will Yip record as well uh, yeah. oh yeah have either of you listened to this band before I have I have uh what you said about Dinosaur Jr. rings very true for mm -hmm. me um definitely like especially like latter latter day dinosaur jr like before like the reunion uh that like period of time where it was just kind of jay masks a solo project mm -hmm. uh yeah definitely i i think i listened to them like forever ago like when they were like first signing to tiny engines or something like i think it was around the time that um at least i think they were on tiny engines because i was like super fucking with runaway brother yeah. and the hotel year and stuff and so like i just paid a lot of attention to tiny engines and i think i listened to one song and it didn't vibe with me at the time but it's one of those things where if i listen now i'd probably like them a lot more just based on what i hear they sound mm -hmm. like uh, oh yeah all right my number five is uh the gateway city sound by time and pressure um, it's arguable as whether this is an LP, uh, because it's kind of like two releases smashed into one, but it's LP length, so I'm going to count it, because it's really fucking good. It's not, like, thrashcore fast, like, it's not, like, power violence, but it is very fast and driving, melodic, but not sacrificing, like, the hardness, uh, Midwest hardcore, with extremely passionate and eloquent and, uh intelligent lyrics um delivered with the kind of conviction that i really miss from 90s hardcore just that like desperate to get it out kind of vocal strain and yeah every every song on this record is a fucking anthem and stick in your head catchy and also like pit ready so if you if you like Pretty much any hardcore in 2019, I think that you will find something to like in Time and Pressure. Cool. My number five is Amo by Bring Me the Horizon. Oh, oh god damn. I fucking <laughs> love this record. So they put out That's the Spirit, like, last year, year before, whatever. And I remember listening to it and being like, what the fuck? Like, this is... Like, I wasn't offended by the fact that it was Radio Rock, but, like, 
it was playing on like laser 103.3 which is like yeah i was local butt rock station where like all yeah. the, like gross racists listen to music and shit <laughs> right um, right and so like i don't know that kind of turned me off but i felt like this record kind of maintained part of that but also like added a little more um appeal and pop and artsiness to it i think that the interludes on this album there's like two or three they're, they're some of the best songs of the year and they're just interludes um grimes produced some of the stuff on this and did some guest spots um which is really cool and i just think it was like the perfect blend for me of like the electronic poppy shit that i'm really into and also like the pseudo heavy kind of things that i'm into um and just like i think there's a lot of tongue, tongue-in-cheek humor kind of about like they wrote a whole song on this album about, heavy metal yeah about like not being yeah. a heavy band anymore and making fun of with people. a with our sarcastic breakdown at the end which is great <laughs> yes it was so sick and i just think that that was that's like a very cool move just kind of like to acknowledge that part of your career while also just like poking fun at the fact that people can't move on um yeah, and then they yeah. put out they put out that single ludens or however you pronounce it ludens ludens a few weeks ago and that song is an absolute ripper it's got a breakdown in the middle it's insane but so the the thing about that's the spirit is that it finally completed bring me the horizons transformation into lincoln park that they started with suicide <laughs> season uh, um and with Amo, I feel like it's kind of similar to the final Linkin Park album. And in a lot of ways, I think it's kind of like taking it that next step further. This album is nowhere on my list, uh, but I don't hate it. And I was very surprised by the fact that I didn't hate it. So uh, take that as, as you will. My introduction to this album was Gavin texting me and saying... Hey, this song come, kind of sounds like it should be a country song, and he sent me a mantra, and he <laughs> was like, "Listen, listen to the main riff. It sounds like a country song," and it was. I was like, "Holy shit! It sounds like a heavy country song," and then I just kind of got hooked on it from there. But it's a, it's a really good record. I, I fuck with it heavy. So, top four, big four, the big four. Uh, my number four, Greet Death, New Hell. Uh, this is a record that came out like about a month, maybe a month and a half ago. I was worried that this was like recency bias for me, but I don't think so. I think this album is like, I feel like by three months from now, this could be like my favorite album from this year or something like that. I, I, it just feels like this one keeps growing and keeps like unpacking itself. Or I keep unpacking it. And um, I think there's just like a lot here. And I've listened to their debut Dixieland like maybe once or twice and I didn't like I, I don't know this album just really 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 latched itself onto me and like I listen to it like every morning um it's, there, there's something very heavy about it kind of like I, I think I've seen some people compare them to like slow core bands like the Wrens and like some people say it's like Jason Molina-esque and stuff like that I, I kind of see that just like all the songs just kind of sound like catastrophically like depressing and they don't really have any like <laughs> fast tempo songs really except for maybe the single on this one uh do you feel nothing um just a really really fascinating sounding record they both have very strange and inaccessible voices um but and it, it's this might be like like this came out on death wish which is like such a left field sound for them to put out but yeah i i i really implore people to check this one out like it's arguably emo adjacent um i know that they kind of play with emo bands when they tour and stuff um i feel like this is kind of like with rot forever by strange ranger that like it over the course of time people find out about it and really like kind of be enamored with it so i hope that happens mm. with this one too I think you actually convinced me to give this one a shot. I've been avoiding it. So, good work. Uh, Michigan is on fire right now. So, like, not actually, but, like, <laughs> uh, um, Michigan uh, Michigan bands I, I be, like, be hidden. I was, like, breaking news. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but there's a lot of good things happening in Michigan for emo. So, yeah. All right. So, 
at this point, I'm starting to feel really bad about all the bands I left out, but that's what the honorable mention is for, I guess. Um, but I, this top four for me is like unfuckwithable. Um, and coming in at the number four spot is Die on Mars by the Callous Dowboys. This is Botch and Glassjaw and Every Time I Die and My Chemical Romance all put in a blender with a cello and nine million different time signatures. And if that sounds interesting to you, then you will fucking love this record. Mathcore is a tricky thing because it's really hard to pull off without just sounding like a an overcomplicated mess that's like trying too hard to be zany. But every single song on this record has like such clarity and strength of purpose and focus. And Carson's lyrics are extremely witty and the production is so crisp that I personally don't have like any problems saying that this is probably the best mathcore album of like the last five years, maybe even of the decade. Um, it's fucking incredible. The Callous Dow Boys are a band to watch for sure. Uh, love this album. Didn't uh, uh, Fantano get on board with them? I have no idea. I think you shouted them out. That's rad. They deserve it. They deserve it any bit of recognition they can get. Um, this album could have gone triple platinum, and I still think it would have been underrated. <laughs> <laughs> I need to listen to that band because that literally sounds like something I would just fuck with so heavy. And I've heard that yes. band name around a bunch. And usually when people talk about them, they're just like, yeah, they're chaotic as hell. And it's sick. Mm -hmm. And I need to give it a shot. The thing is, like, it is chaotic, but it's not chaotic in that way that's like chaos for chaos's sake. Like, Dillinger's every song. Strong... Yeah, I mean, I love Dillinger, but like every song has like an extremely strong central structure. And I can't emphasize enough, like, how much a treat the lyrics are to listen to. Like, just so much talent in this band. My number four is uh, Super Enthusiast by Max Seal. Max Seal was a band I, like, lightly fucked with for a long time. Um, like, I heard their song Cats from their first EP a couple years ago. And I was like, oh, that's a cool song. And so I just only listened to that song for a while. And then I think Sure Thing Shelley heard that song. And I was like, oh, this is, this is pretty cool. Um, but this record really like just cemented that they're just like a really, really good emo band. The first song reminded me like of the Beach Boys almost, just like the vibe of it was so feel good and so catchy and just like oh, yeah. so melodically driven. And I think lyrically this record kind of fills in like what I missed about like the tail end of modern baseball. It's just got that like kind of simple melancholic writing style that's not like not overly simple or immature it's just like the right amount of um you know looking back at being younger and stuff and it's just a really well-written record all the performances are really good there are some songs that i listen to and i will literally be like oh the bass is the best part of this song that's crazy and then another song will come on and i'll be like oh damn the guitars are both doing like really cool stuff but yeah just a really good band we played with them a couple of years ago in philly and, like, nobody was there. I just remember watching them and being like, how are there not more people watching this right now? Like, they're all just such technically good musicians and really, really great songwriters. So, yeah, that that was a very good album this year. Word. It just, it just uh, occurred to me that Max Seal is, like, nowhere on my list. I don't think I've actually even listened to this record. <laughs> I, I should rectify that. I'm sorry. It's, it's good. It's easy to listen to. This record is either an honorable mention or coming up on my list. I'm not going to spoil which one, but we'll get to it later eventually. Hell yeah. All right. Hell yeah. All right. Top three. My number three. Regional Justice Center. Institution. Uh, God is... damn. I'm so stoked to see this this high on your list. Yeah, me, me, me too. It, it just got to that point where I was like, I'm listening to this like, like so fucking often that this is going to be like a top five and parsing it all out. Yeah, for sure. It's a top five for me, even though it's five minutes long, even though it's an EP. Um, <laughs> just like, I like, I don't know if I can call us better than anything else that they've done. This is a power violence band. Um, first thing that they've done for triple B. Um, it just, I don't know. I, I feel like, um, you know, it's like weird to see like, you know, like a true power violence band be this like kind of, um, they're not like artsy, but like this whole project is like an ongoing sort of statement, political statement. Um, 
and yeah. like uh, yeah. seeing them live, they splice in conversations from Ian's brother from jail and stuff like that. And it just seems like bigger than just like ignorant power violence. And I think it just heightens it all. But yeah, it's like it's five minutes long. It's extremely pissed off. It just hits everything that I want in like aggressive music and give it a listen if you like anything remotely just like pissed off hell yeah yeah all right um my number three is our voices will soar forever by amygdala um this is a band that's kind of local to me san antonio um and i think i mentioned before on this podcast i saw them opening for uh gouge away and soul glow this band is so fucking underrated so fucking good lyrics that take kind of like the personal is political ethos of the og revolution summer era of emo to heart um lyrics about borderline personality disorder uh lyrics about the erasure of mental illness lyrics about the whitewashing of history and the simultaneous alienation and self-affirmation of you know identity in america um with, with instrumentation that throws together screamo and like shred metal and uh like dreamy post-rock post-hardcore uh all into this soup that feels confrontational and comforting and euphoric and desperate all at once like this album is dream passionate and um if anything i said sounded interesting to you uh please look up amygdala and read their lyrics and give your attention to this band because they demand it and deserve it i liked the part where you called it a soup yes well, check it out. <laughs> it's like a soup that's pretty solid i li like soup <laughs> yeah um i've also noticed that we have said hell yeah probably about seven thousand times on this podcast so far it's just, it's just how we transition to the next subject. Yeah, it's it's, it's an easy it's an easy way. It's great. It's Hell just, yeah! It's like situation. okay, this section is over. Move on. <laughs> Hell yeah! So Hell yeah. yeah! Hell yeah! My number three um, is "Somewhere City" by Origami Angel. Um, mm -hmm. Origami Angel is probably like the next big emo band. It's just like not even contestable at this point. I don't think. Um, they this record is just really cohesive in a way that's not boring or dull like there are some records that came out this year that kind of did like a whole cohesion thing that i just did not like vibe with it felt like i was listening to one song that was way too long um whereas this record did a really good job of just like letting the songs be what they are without like forcing them to all meld together while still holding a concept throughout I think the 24 hour drive through, I, they played that song on tour in June and it just like immediately, like I fell in love with it when they started playing it and hearing the recorded version was just like surreal. Cause it was just so cool to hear it just like finished and polished and everything. Um, and I think like at the very last song, when it kind of starts fading out into the intro, um, it's a very, very cool reflective moment in the album that made me just be like damn i really did just listen to a really good album um <laughs> and i there were just a lot of bangers and a lot of good moments um i think ian cohen's like write-up of this record on pitchfork was actually like a really spot on really spot yeah. on um write-up about it and i'm just excited for ryland and pat to get better and to get older and to get you know to increase their songwriting chops even more as they go but yeah, this was a really good record and it's honestly kind of good game changing and it's one of those things where i'm also excited because it's like with work on the angel kind of being on the come up like the entire scene that's associated with them is going to get like a slight boost you know yeah um yeah and so it's just cool to see that kind of like rising tide of friends happening well what, what was the album earlier tyler that you said the the lyrics reminded you of being 18 uh jail socks jail socks yes uh so that is the exact same feeling i get with origami angel um i've heard people kind of shit on their lyrics but i feel like if 
the people in this band were fronting as anything other than like sweet dorks who played Pokemon and got chicken nuggets all the time, then that would be like betraying the essence of the band, which is just like this youthful enthusiasm that cannot be fucked with. Yeah. And that's the thing, mm-hmm. if you meet Ryland and Pat and talk to them for five seconds, it makes sense. Like there's yes. like like you said, there's really nothing else <laughs> that they could be like if Rylan tried to be like super deep, I would be like, no, like, why are you doing this? This isn't you. Like, they're just well intentioned, good, goofy people. And extremely honest musicians, which, yes. which is know, of that's, fantastic quality. It's valuable. Yeah. Okay. Top two. Uh, the, does everyone kind of know or anticipate what everyone's top two is going to be? No, I, I have no idea. I have no idea. I well, I think I know Tyler's number one probably. Same. Same. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, but that's it. Uh, my number two is 100 Gex and their album 1000 Gex. I feel like everyone has kind of said everything about this record online, um, and no one really knows what to call it. Um, I don't know what it like. I think it's PC music. Is that is that an accurate thing? The th- the tag I've heard thrown around is bubblegum bass. Bubblegum bass. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, I don't know anything about electronic music. Like I don't listen to it. Yeah. But that's that's just what I've heard. Yeah. What I mean, like, and this is, um, I think it's descendant of people who like electronic music, but it's kind of um, spilled out into every everyone knows about one hundred X at this point. Um, I don't know. Yes. Like, correct. I, I I I don't know. It's the most confounding thing I've heard. Uh, in a long time and I love it and I can't really say anything intelligent about it besides like it just it just like works like there's a ska song there there's death metal vocals on a song um it's just it's very maximalist um I don't know <laughs> yeah. Maximalist. yeah I don't I, I don't know I'm just full I'm just fully immersed in this world that is 100 gex <laughs> word um Okay, my number two. I want to preface this by saying the only reason that this didn't get my album of the year is because it's only 23 minutes long. Um, 1,000 Gex by 100 Gex. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, like I said before, I don't listen to electronic music at all. The span only came on my radar because someone was like, hey, look at the music video for Money Machine. Uh, Laura Les is wearing an I Hate Sex shirt. Um, and I listened to it and it it is probably the most addictive music experience I've had in a long time. Like this is a repeat album. This is listen like once a day album because it's so short. Have you ever read the reviews on rate your music for this album? No, I should though. It's it's proof that critical theory is dead (laughs) because everyone is trying to... (laughs) Everyone is trying to analyze this album as if it's trying to say something deep about pop culture, but that's not it. Like, this album is not post-ironic. If I had to put a label on it, maybe post-post-ironic, but I don't think the people making this record fucking care. Um, It's just everything that they grew up on smashed together in this absurd, sarcastic, earnest, obnoxious, endlessly energetic blend. Um... And I like like every, every song feels like it shouldn't work, but it does. Ringtone is like maybe one of the best pop songs of all time. Yeah, um, I feel like that is like the biggest standalone song that could like. For example, I have shown this album to so many people. Only one person has been like, "Oh, this is good," and like I feel like it's because I showed them Ringtone. Yes. Um, I played this in the car for Dina and she was like, please never play this again. Um, (laughs) like this, this is the definition of an album that's just not for everyone. But like, if you click with just the, this like exuberance and playfulness, um, and how like messy and raw it is, um, this is like the most well-constructed electronic album that i personally have ever listened to um and it's got such like a unique sense of humor and 
you just like the personality is bleeding out of every pore. And I'm really glad that DIY kids seem to be getting on board with it because it makes perfect sense. Yeah. This, uh, this is what 2020 music should sound like. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I remember the first time I listened to this album, I put it on and I was just very confused. Like, I just didn't know what was happening. It was like that disoriented Mr. Krabs meme. I was just like, what the fuck? And then I like turned it off because I was like, no, never again. And then like, the next day, I was like, I need to listen to it. Like, I have to listen to it again. There's, like, no way for me not to listen to that album. And, yeah, I actually ended up growing on me so absurdly. And, like, it's not in my top ten or anything, but just the weirdest <laughs> trajectory of a record to grow on me. Because my first thought was, like, fuck this EDM kid bullshit. And I turned it off. And then now I'm like, okay, this is sick. <laughs> Yeah, it's fucking dope. I love it. (laughs) My friend Bobby tweeted, like, I think the most poignant thing about people's reaction to this record is um, some people have the cilantro gene, but for 100 gex. Yes. I think that's pretty accurate. Yeah. Yeah, my number two, unfortunately, is not 1000 gex by 100 gex. It is Ginger by Brockhampton, which... um, 100 gets are, were actually on tour with Brockhampton, mm-hmm. which is yes. wild. Yes. I was I was going to go to that show, and then I wrecked my van on tour, and then so I didn't have a vehicle for the show, which is a bummer. But um, but yeah, Ginger by Brockhampton is an insanely good record. I didn't really get on the Brockhampton train until Iridescence, so like coming into it, I didn't know like all the controversy around Amir when he was in the group and didn't really know anything about any of that but this record kind of explores that whole situation and and i think that it makes it like a really really powerful listen on certain parts and i just think that some of the songs in this are so goddamn catchy like sugar i think is like one of the best songs of the decade and they performed it on ellen which is wild just like the thought of just like how big they've gotten compared to when they like first released like saturation But yeah, it's just a really, really good listen all the way through. I feel like um, it's cohesive, but the songs that stick out don't feel out of place. Um, I really, really, upon the initial listen, I wasn't sure how I felt about the production and the instrumentation. There's like trombone that sounds weird in parts and like weird banjo stuff. And my first thought when I heard that was like, oh, this sounds like some odd future stuff. Like it sounds like it's trying to be weird for the sake of being weird. But then when I heard the whole album all together, I was like, okay, no, this is like an intentional, like well thought out um, process in terms of the production. Dom is like the, one of the best rappers that I like, that I have knowledge of. I don't listen to enough rap to say that he's like that good, but like whenever his lyrics are just amazing and well thought out and it's just a very, uh, very enjoyable record. And I think I'm going to probably, it'll be one of my favorites from the whole decade, honestly. So, yeah. Word. <laughs> okay. Number one. Uh, this was my number one ever since I heard it. Shungard 2020. Um, God damn. It just, it, there was nothing <laughs> I could top it. And I still feel that way. Um, yeah. I still like these songs more than <laughs> Death of Spring songs though really you could lump that into here because it's just been a wild year for Shingard. um i fucking love this album so much uh it's so accessible but like still just it's also like throwbacky to like almost like fall of troy type stuff uh just with their insane guitar work um kennedy never blows that has never stopped blowing my mind every time i hear it um yeah just it's basically what you said ellie is how i feel about it just the, you know the fucking closer just is thrilling just it's fucking thrilling to listen to um like the best closer of anything heavy i've heard this year or any even in like a long time um yeah i can't i can't wait to see what happens to Shingard. i feel like i feel like they can take like a trajectory such as code orange and turnstile all these bands that kind of find themselves everywhere but still making yeah. hard, like hardcore music yeah for sure um okay are you all ready for my number one i have no idea what it is um my number one is nine by blink 182 this album is proof Uh. that tom DeLonge was just (laughs) holding the band back 
at every venture. <laughs> I can't. I'm sorry. I I'm like. I right I now. thought I could. I thought I could keep this bit up, but I truly can't. <laughs> like, I had like a thing I was gonna say, but like I just fell apart. Um, That's good. I was real shocked. <laughs> <laughs> My number one for 2019 is Fake Blood by Heart Attack Man. Oh, um, that's right. That's I right. That that's record. right. Oh that's a good record. So, the musical base of Heart Attack's Heart Attack Man's music is. Power pop uh, mixed with like the crunch and heft of hardcore, with uh, oca- occasionally some like emo and pop punk like overtones, and I think especially uh, Eric's vocals are pretty indebted to Christian Holden. But even though the music is catchy as fuck, the thing that really draws me into Fake Blood is the lyrics, and I don't think that many people would think to make this comparison. But I hear a lot of Jawbreaker in Heart Attack Man's lyrics. Um, and a, a lot of people probably would like write them off as a meme band because of their internet presence, which, by the way, is stellar. But there, there's such uh, an immediately relatable to me uh, a blend of like wit and anger and apathy and exhaustion in in Heart Attack Man's lyrics that I I think made this album like the standout of 2019 from the moment I heard it. And if you break it down to like individual songs, um, like Out for Blood is, it's based off the movie Falling Down, but I, I have listened to it and kind of taken it in as, you know, this critique of like violence, fetishism, and uh, white male mass shooters, and it's surprisingly salient. Um, Crisis Actor is a really good condemnation of the way that liberals co-opt leftist talking points and uh, use it to accrue social capital for nefarious ends. Um, And my favorite song of this entire year is Cut My Losses, which they've gotten flack for because... uh, in some ways, I'm sure it could be construed as problematic. You know, it's about um, not caring how a how a suicidal person is doing anymore. But the way it's presented is just all the resentment that fills inside of you when you're in an emotionally abusive relationship where someone uses self-harm and suicide as a weapon. Um, it, and it, and it, it all comes out in, like, this perfectly articulated flurry of anger and when i saw them live i like literally couldn't stop myself from screaming along there's a picture of me on their twitter page of like screaming along to that song and i look like a fucking goblin like just so embarrassing (laughs) i i i couldn't help it it just the this this is kind of a concept album about growing up and realizing uh the persona that people create for themselves and wanting to break out of that persona for yourself and i adored it it's my it's my favorite record of the year by far oh yeah i i'm like bummed almost that i forgot that that record came out this year i don't know why because i really liked it when i heard it um and i remember thinking oh like my first thing was his voice kind of sounds like the dude from some 41 and <laughs> kind of scares like pop punk itch from the year 2003 for me, you know, but there's a song on the record called asking for it. And he literally sings this one line, like, uh, I'm not the kid you knew back in high school. (laughs) And I feel like it's a, it's a, I feel like it's a deliberate nod to some 41. Yeah, I'm sure it is. Good album. Mine's not going to be shocking, but I'm, I'm so passionate about it. Um, (laughs) My number one is When We All Fall Asleep, Where Do We Go? <laughs> by Billy Eilish. Yep. <laughs> and this is not a bit. And this, is a bit. Um, this record, I remember, so I was like scrolling around on the internet one day, and uh, this guy that used to fill in for Stars Hollow on drums, he, um, he drums for like Andy Black now and does like crazy shit. He's in a band called Point North, too. Um, he posts a lot of drum videos on the internet. And he posted one of him playing along to Lovely, which is an older Billie Eilish song. And I remember being like, I listened to that song and I was like, oh, well, you know, whatever. But then I checked out her Instagram page and was just scrolling through. And then I saw a, like a screenshot from the When the Party's Over video 
where she starts crying like black stuff out of her eyes. And I was like, oh shit, that's the most emo shit I've ever seen in my life. Like that's like so hot topic. That's so 2007. And I just went and watched that video and I was like, this is amazing. Like I thought the production was so good. All the vocal layering was just really, really cool. I liked the simplicity of the music video. Um, I just, and I just liked how it was very mature for what a 16 or 17 year old should be writing. Um, it's just like took a concept that probably is very adolescent and teenage and just made it, made it feel so much bigger um, than it really is. And then when the record came out, I just like listened to it front to back like five times. I immediately went to Target and bought it because the CD with, came with like temporary tattoos. And I was like, this is sick. I want these temporary tattoos. And I just listened to it front to back so often. And then I listened to the song Zanny a bunch because that song's like a straight edge anthem. And no one has <laughs> said it, but it is. It's a straight edge anthem. It's like literally, it's like, I don't need a Zanny to feel better. And like talking shit about being around people smoking and just like wanting to sit there and drink pop at a party, like just a pure straight edge anthem. And it's, and I think that was a big thing for me too with this record was one of the criticisms was that it sounded like zanned out teenage bullshit. And I was like, no, no, no. Cause it's not like it's, that's not what it stands for. That's not what it seems like she stands for. And just the flow of the songs. Uh, the last song kind of does like the recap kind of thing where it has like little lines from every song in it which i'm a sucker for and i think my big thing too is just thinking of like the cultural impact that this record probably had on younger kids i don't know it sounds kind of stupid because it's not as intense or insane but it's kind of like when i was probably like 12 and i saw marilyn manson for the first time and i was like oh that's weird but that's cool and this is like the way played down version of that of kids are probably like, oh, that's super weird, but that's cool. And I went into Hot Topic. I bought some Billie Eilish shirts. You know, I haven't went to Hot Topic for years. So I think it's just kind of like, I feel like I'm young again and it's a good record. So yeah, I stand by Billie Eilish forever, even if she is a industry plant. Because <laughs> <laughs> her parents are in the music industry and her brother is a producer. So mm. I think there's some degree of something there but they definitely uh things changed with this record and it doesn't feel like that's a factor anymore so i kind okay. of like um, i listen to it i feel like for pop it's so subdued you know yeah i think that's what, part of why i like it yeah um i like how like low-key it is i like that the melodies are coming purely from like I don't know, like, obvious places, because, like, the, the instrumentation and the production, none of it is, like, loud and in your face. It's, like, you have to kind of get it from the vocals, and yeah. it's not, like, belting ever, but it still is impressive and catchy. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, like, there's nothing else that I can think of that sounds exactly like it in pop. And the closest things I can think of really aren't that, like, weird and goofy or anything. They're, like, this kind of is sometimes, so. Yeah. Okay. So honorable mentions. I feel like you both should go first. <laughs> <laughs> right. Honestly. Um, mine were mentioned on a lot of these lists. Um, oh, so, oh, so basking in the glow. I have this thing where an album gets too much hype and I need to not listen to it until all, all the hype has died down. And I think this is the exact reason why, because I feel like I kept, like missing the points of oh so oh so because i was listening to this when everyone's just like best thing yet and i was just like i don't hear the best thing yet sort of thing and i just keep getting frustrated so the jury's still out on oh so oh so i really like four 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 songs and i'm gonna come back to it in like a bunch of months um vampire weekend love the album i think this isn't like worth the insufferable amount of anticipation we had to sit through but i really like it i but i saw them live and they jammed and i hated it i i was really disappointed by, <laughs> by their live show because they like literally did like a 15 minute bob dylan cover i was like fuck this shit but whatever that's just where they're at i gotta respect that origami angel i love this record i think this would be like number 12 or number 11 for me um i i just love rylan's cadence all over this album like 
just his like vocal is like the second guitar you know it's it's crazy yeah. it's crazy um also them getting into a studio did wonders for for them instead of like claudio recording it or something i don't know how they recorded it um previously but like the album sounds very very good um earth gang mirrorland is my favorite hip-hop record this year very very freaky hip-hop um people compare them to outcast i totally get it kind of underrated too out of all like the dreamville stuff i i i ride for earth gang the hardest um max seal really really love that album everything you said like there's a song with like that killer bass line that was my favorite part on that song too i totally uh, got what you were saying about it tyler um i saw them this year and they did a set where they were the backing band for i'm glad it's you and that was super cool too um glass beach has not been mentioned on this podcast at all until now um ellie i'm curious what you think about them um i am kind of in that point where i love four songs on this record but it's also like an hour long and um i think that whole hour long thing kind of waters it down because it's not all amazing but there's four like killer songs on this thing um uh, i don't know if i believe in post emo but i kind of get why people call it that and then oh yeah ellie come in um okay so glass beach uh i had literally like 20 people message me when this record came out being like yo you should listen to this you will enjoy it um and so predictably my initial reaction was one of complete apathy um and then the more i listened to it and tried to get into it the more i started to like genuinely hate it um and (laughs) i feel like it's it reminds me of the brave little abacus but like opposite like everything the brave little abacus did uh in service of the song uh glass beach does like in a weird self-indulgent way and i worry that people who are in glass beach i don't know if it's like a one person band or something but like i i worry that they will listen to this podcast and uh be mad at me um and uh, I I just want to tell you I I think you're a victim of people telling me what to do. <laughs> wow. Because uh, I might have I I might have really enjoyed it if I if I hadn't been uh, told that I would like it. <laughs> hmm. That's a that's an interesting yeah. take on the whole thing. <clears throat> people throw the word inventive around them, but how is it inventive if it kind of comes from the same cloth of Brave Little Abacus, which I'm sure they're fans of. Right. Right. So. I don't know, but uh, in, like incredible songwriting. Like, how do you write an album like that? That's beyond me. Um, and my last honorable mention is JPEG Mafia, which is hardly an honorable mention because I, I, I'm, I feel like, I feel like this album's kind of mid. Yeah, it's not on my list at all. Also, I, don't know, I might have fallen off the JPEG Mafia train. I have not listened to the, the. I have listened to like half of the Prince Daddy album because of like, <laughs> because of hype. I was just like. I'm not going to be in the right headspace to listen to this, so I'll get to it when I get to it. Okay. All right. My honorable mentions. There's not really that many. Uh, let's see here. You Swear It's Getting Better Every Day by Kayak Jones. Um, I really think this is a very good record. It's just kind of not in the wheelhouse of like what I want out of the kind of bands that I listen to like this now. Very good performances, very good lyrics. There's like objectively, like it's just such a good record. Um, and... Mm. Lonely Codependent is one of my favorite songs of the year, but just, like, the record as a whole um, just, like, didn't stick with me as much, but that band is so good, and they deserve all the good things in the world. Um, Fake Blood, Heart Attack Man, now that I remember that that exists, that record's really, really good. Perspective put a new record out this year, um, and I listened to it, and I remember thinking, I like this, but I never revisited it, but I liked it enough on that first listen that I thought I should mention it here. Fate's Worse Than Death by Short Fictions uh, just came out today, um, and I just started listening to it, and so I don't think it would be fair to put it anywhere on my top ten, but um, it's a good record. I think a lot of the... I enjoy that they are a bit more serious of an emo band, um, because I just feel like the scene that Stars is part of right now, we're, like, the serious band out of the, like, goofy bands, you know? 
It's um, absurd that in 2019, it's a shock to hear an emo band that's serious. I know, it's, it's wild. <laughs> But it's like when when I saw the title for this album and I started listening to it, I was like, shit, like, like real serious. There's not really much goofiness to it. And any goofiness that's there is like pretty low key and not like, you know, something to be attentive toward. But but yeah, it was just kind of like a nice feeling as like a band part of the same scene to be like, oh, we're not the only ones who were like overly serious, like with our music. So um, so that was good. And then two two kind of, they weren't really like. They weren't albums, but be- the two singles that Beach Bunny put out this year, phenomenal. I'm really excited for that record. Um, and then that new Fireworks song, I really liked a lot. Um, oh, god damn, yeah. I remember just being so shocked that there was a new song, and then I listened to it, and I was just, like, floored by the composition of it. But yeah, yeah. Too, that's, uh, that's all my honorable mentions. I don't have a whole ton. Um, but yeah, like, this year I didn't like as much music as I thought i would so all right um i don't i i don't know if y'all are ready this is like (laughs) dumb big um i'm gonna i'm gonna try and say as little as possible if y'all have an opinion on it just feel free to stop me um but i'm just, just gonna dive in so like sneaking in at the very bottom of the honorable mentions is actually Billie eilish when we all fall asleep where do we go yeah um, Ever since you've like talked her up last year, it's been sticking in my craw, and I've <laughs> kind of spent I've kind of spent this year a little bit struggling with like uh, my growing appreciation for who Billie Eilish is and what she does. Because when I when I first came upon her, I kind of like had the same reaction to her as I do to Twenty One Pilots. Like I felt <laughs> like it was like a like a co optation of an aesthetic. Um, but, you know, I really appreciate just kind of like how the fact that she has become an enormous pop star, like over a billion plays on Spotify, insane. Um, but like a huge pop star by being like an anti-pop star, wearing baggy clothing, like avoiding the sexualization of an underage girl. And honestly this record's got some got some fucking bangers on it like i think if you say that bad guy isn't a good song you should get your head checked or sorry it isn't a good song you should get your head checked it's a great record ghost spirit hourglass solid screamo band uh you're gonna hear the slot but not as good as their old stuff so it just uh it, it missed 93 feet of smoke just various singles i kind of grouped this together because i feel like if it had been released as an album or an ep it would have charted higher um, but 93 Feet of Smoke, really good, catchy emo trap artist. Check it out. Injury Reserve, self-titled, extremely fun hip-hop, um, and then shout-out to their track with JPEG Mafia and Code Orange, and also their 1000 Gex remix. Rico Nasty, Anger Management. Ooh. I hopped on the Rico, yeah, hopped on the Rico Nasty train way too late, but she fucking rules. She is like, you know, that, that punchline rap, but updated for a modern audience and with none of the cringiness. Like, I, I'd say her writing style is kind of like a bizarro version of early childish Gambino, you know, where mm-hmm. you listen to his punchlines and go like, ugh. But when I listen to Rico's punchlines, I'm like, oh, fuck yeah. Uh, Regional Justice Center Institution, you fucking nailed it, Kyle. Uh, it's like... It's 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 sociopolitically important for this band to exist, and it helps that they fucking rip. No right senescence, I think is how you say it. Uh, just really fucking good, aggressive hardcore. Uh, Touche Amore, Dead Horse X. If this had not just been a re, if like if this was a new album, like with the exact like the exact same songs, like if they didn't put out to the beat of a dead horse and it said it came out today, this would have made my top ten. But the re-recording is really fucking aggressive and good, um, and I love this band. Um, Wicca Face Springs Eternal, Suffer On. Uh, I feel like we already talked about it, so I'm going to move on. Reign of Salvation and War Outside and Within. Fucking solid metalcore. I can see this band going heavy places. Frail Body, A Brief Memoriam. Really good adventurous screamo record. Came out a little late in the year for me to sit with it. Um, so it didn't make my top ten, but... Maybe if I revisit this this list like six months from now, it will make the 2019 top ten. Uh, Earth Gang, like this record a lot. Everything Kyle already said. Uh, Nouvelle Escura, self-titled. Extremely technically proficient 
and passionate screamo. Um, if it had just been a little bit longer, if it had given me a little bit more to chew on, it, it could have been higher. Uh, Tyler the Creator, Igor. I feel like following up Scumfuck Flower Boy, which is like a career-defining album for Tyler, was really difficult on him. And uh, I do think like the soundscapes that he created with the production on this album are fucking gorgeous and immersive. But vocally, it left a little bit to be desired. Um, the Division of Mind record, fucking hard, fucking ignorant. Check it out. Uh, Ghost Main Fear Network. Ghost Main's rap shit left me a little cold this year, but Fear Network is a really, really good hardcore EP that I was I was surprised by. But it's 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 dope. Uh, Never Ending Game, just another day. This band has been like improving with every single release. Um, to me, the big drawback with them is the vocals. I think that they're a little bit too caveman. Songwriting wise, it's extremely catchy hooky beat down hardcore in the vein of early cold as life little peep everybody's everything if i hadn't heard everything on this record before it came out would have made my top 10 bones i feel like dirt another solid mixtape from the master ian shelton and pretty maddie ian from regional justice center uh doing power pop fucking great two records from scar lord immortalization and acquired taste volume one scar lord is an extremely aggressive hyperactive rapper his vocal approach is almost entirely screaming and it leaves me almost exhausted uh, every time I listen to him. But I love him a lot. Uh, counterparts, nothing left to love. Counterparts doing counterparts. If this had been a weaker year for music, probably would have made my top ten. Uh, Suicide Boys, Live Fast, Die Whenever. This sounds like Slipknot coming from the opposite end. Like, instead of, you know, heavy music crossing over with rap, this is rap crossing over with heavy music. Suicide Boys have, like, a long history with hardcore uh, but I might get shit on for this because, you know, I think a lot of people thought this was corny, but I liked it a lot. Uh, Taking Meds, I Hate Me. Uh, really, Good a really fun, really fun pop punky uh, record, but a little bit technical uh, in the guitar work and really refreshingly cynical and angry lyrics. Blade, Echo 2K, and Tie Boy Digital, Trash Island. Great sad boy mixtape. Um, if you like Young Lean, you'll love it. Um, I have a whole section devoted to Sean Decker's bands. Prolonged Exposure by All These Fucking Eyes, uh, Val Fialgo by Coma Regalia, and On Guard by Repost. Uh, if you like extremely cathartic, way too personal screamo, you will love all three of these albums. The Repost record in particular kind of sounds like uh, The 400 Years, uh, if you're aware of that band. Um, and All These Fucking Eyes is super chaotic, like, hard to listen to. But, you know, I think if you get get through the difficulty, it's pretty rewarding. Mortality Rate, You Were the Gasoline. Fucking really great, hardcore, ripping, super fast. Uh, Rejection Pact, that, that record. I forget what the name of it is. I, I forgot to write it down. But that was also a really good, real short, uh, fun, hardcore EP this year. Uh, Ceremony in the Spirit World Now. I hated this album at first. The more I listened to it, the more it grew on me. Real good post-punk. Uh, Glitterer, Looking Through the Shades. Extremely... Like, it, I, I feel like this record, honestly, is like an improvement on what the Ceremony was trying. Ceremony record was trying to go for. But maybe that's just because like, I'm a f title fight stan and will defend everything that the members need my death. Uh, Juice World, Death Race for Love. Uh, it's a little long, but it's really fucking good, and I'm not just saying that because he's dead now. I liked it before he died. <laughs> Magnitude to whatever fateful end, and Envision in Desperation, and Abuse of Power, What on Earth Can We Do? Kind of lump all three of these records together because they're just really fun, stompy, hardcore. Um, this It's melodic without necessarily being melodic hardcore. It just had, All three of these records kind of just have that kind of like crunchy but jangly and accessible guitar tone um and all the records are about 20 minutes long and you can bang bang all three of them out in an hour uh highly suggest that uh left behind no one goes to heaven i feel like this record is pretty much just blessed by the burn part two and that's actually where it falls apart for me um because it's much longer and uh, it doesn't really like create any new ideas, but still, if you like that like desperate regret core type shit, you'll be into it. 
hundreds of AU mission priorities on launch. Tom is master of screamo, going back to you and I. Really, really good emotive hardcore the way it was meant to be played. Uh, the Sleepwalk Transmissions by We Never Learn to Live. If you like mid-era Under Oath, like Changing of the Times through to find the Great Line, but wish it sounded like DIY, uh, you will love this record. Chamber, Ripping, Pulling, Tearing, and Year of the Knife, Ultimate Aggression. Both of these are kind of comps that uh, Pure Noise put out, uh, but they're really fucking great, heavy, ass-ripping hardcore. Senza, even a worm will turn. Dizzying, Blackened Screamo with some of the best guitar work I've ever heard in the genre. Uh, Seizures, Reverie of the Revolving Diamond, one of those math core releases that uh, was pretty good this year, but unfortunately the Callous Dad Boys overshadowed it. Oso Oso, Basking in the Glow, everything that could be said about this record was said already. Uh, Soul Glow, I am not allowed to say the name of this record, but to go Juggalo, uh, the ninja in me is me. Um, <laughs> uh, really, really inventive genre splicing music screamo and noise and hip-hop all kind of being baked into one with more of those personalist political lyrics that i love so much uh black matter device hostile architecture uh, another b plus math core record judiciary surface noise i they remind me of like a, a heavier power trip like a power trip with a stronger low end so if that sounds good check them out that's an honorable uh, that i forgot Nedarb. about yeah yeah nedarb amity if nothing else, listen to this album because what the fuck? This is a emo rap album with a guy wearing a fucking Sasha sweater on the cover. <laughs> Absurd. Really good. Um, excellent production. Sanction, Broken and Refraction, goddamn hard. Gangstar, one of the best yet. Uh, really refreshing to hear these guys back again. Really good features on this album from MOP and Group Home and Royce to 5'9. Hmm. Honestly, uh, Imp I, I was impressed. I wasn't expecting it to be as good as it was. Uh, Kevin Abstract, Arizona Baby, way better than the Brock oh, Camp. Fuck. In my opinion. I yeah. forgot that record came out this year. Damn, yeah. I thought that was 2018. Dick, that's a good record. Uh, yeah. Uh, Kirk by the Baby. Um, it's great. Less ignorant than less ignorant than you're probably expecting. Honestly, like it's got like ignorant banger vibes, but the lyrics are surprisingly uh, intricate. Uh, Danny Brown, you know what I'm saying? I honestly, like, this is obviously a great record or else it wouldn't be here, but um, Danny Brown is in my personal top five MCs of all time, and I think uh, he just didn't reach the standard that he set before with, you know, XXX and Atrocity Exhibition. Yeah, I'd say that um, album's like a 7 out of 10 at best for yeah. me. Yeah. yeah. Uh, proper, I spent the winter writing songs about getting better went into this album expecting not to like it actually very much because uh, just the way that Ian Cohen wrote about it. It's really good. Solid uh, pop punky emo with uh, li lyrics that feel more honest than a lot of other bands that try and, you know, tackle the same subjects. You know, it just has like a more of like a, a visceral, youthful angle. Uh, Fury, Failed Entertainment. This, uh, this record is actually less arty than I thought it was on first listen. Um, it's still just real fun, California hardcore, uh, less youth crew than the last record, uh, which I think is why I felt it was arty, but honestly, I really enjoyed it. Foxtails, Carita Iha. Fuck, Carita Iha. Sorry, I botched the pronunciation of it. But really good twinkly screamo with uh, fucked up lyrics. Highly recommend it. The new Fireworks song, uh, obviously, love Fireworks. Uh, we'll support everything that do, at the, everything that they do from like now to the end of time. Uh, the Snag album uh, took long enough for them to put out an LP. Uh, extremely good, environmentally conscious screamo. Uh, kind of takes from like the post rock atmospheric side of the genre, but the songs are still extremely visceral and compact and to the point. Um, with like. Real heavy moments, real chaotic guitar work, but that still maintains melody. Highly recommend it. Short Fictions, Fate's Worse Than Death. I heard this record a like, pretty good long while before it came out. Um, the only reason it's not in the top ten is because the other records were so fucking good. I really enjoy this album, and I'm so excited to see where Short Fictions goes next. Prince Daddy and the Hyena, Cosmic Thrill Seekers. I actually, you know, enjoyed this record, maybe just from, like, exposure, because this is Dina's album of the year, and she plays it constantly in the car. <laughs> um, but 
it's uh, it, it's it's a fun listen. I unfortunately don't really have much more to say about it than that. Uh, Origami Angel Somewhere City. I think this is actually like a uh, more polished and fun version of Cosmic Thrill Seekers. Uh, not necessarily in concept, but in execution. And uh, Say Less is the best diss track of the fucking year. Um, <laughs> Knocked Loose, a different shade of blue. I really like Knocked Loose. Um, I don't think this record is as good as pop culture or laugh tracks, but I'm excited to see that they're going in more of like an emotive direction and that they're switching up the songwriting and there's still lots of dumb mosh bangers on it. And I think Brian is one of the most unique vocalists in hardcore right now. Uh, Gift from God, Approximation of a Human, wonky, heavy out the ass songwriting, really heavily influenced by like noise and math core, but it's not really quite either of those. It's just somewhere in that screamo metalcore combination area, and uh, it's pretty uh, short and addictive listen. And then final one, sorry for this extremely long list, but Wrist Meat Razor, Misery Never Forgets. Thank God that Zayo is still making albums, or else I would say that Wrist Meat Razor is the new Zayo. <laughs> that album came mm-hmm. out a long time ago. January 2020. Yeah. It's been in constant rotation since then. Damn. Ellie. That was a lot of records. Hell yeah. <laughs> Are there albums that you didn't listen to that you didn't talk about? <laughs> uh, not off the top of my head. If like if someone I'm friends with is listening to this and is like, hey, you forgot to mention my record. Fucking sorry. There was too much good shit this year. Yeah, And in addition to this, I was doing the fucking Bands You Weren't Supposed to Like series, so I was, like, listening to, like, old MySpace core albums on repeat mm-hmm. and still somehow found time to listen to all this shit. I feel, like, honestly overwhelmed looking at how much less music I listened to this year. Mm-hmm. All sorry. right. So we're going to go into... Oh, shit. Also, I'm sorry. Uh, if, I... <laughs> <laughs> if I can also just shout out the latest Higher Power single. Uh, that record is probably going to be in my albums of the year next year. Uh, Alice in Chains core. <laughs> nice. Reddit style our emo awards. This will go quick. It has gone quick every time we've done it. We've done this since we started the podcast. Uh, this will be a, a poll that appears on our emo, and we're just casting our votes here live on air. Emo artist of the year. I will go with Origami Angel just because the sheer amount of music that they put out this year and it was all above an 8. I don't think there's anything that they released that is below that. And that's so impressive. And they've just grown throughout the year, too. Well-deserved, in my opinion. Gami Gang. Same vote. Yep. Gami Gang. There's, like, no one else that did as much and grew as much this year. So mm-hmm. there's no no way that anyone else would even compare. It's wild. And yep. it, I'm so glad that they're touring, like, finally. I feel like they weren't really making it outside of the that that East Coast corner, and now they're going all over. And I'm finally going to see them in January. Oh, shit, yeah, they weren't on the tour with us yet when we played with them, were they? Nope. Damn. That'll be sick. Yeah. Very good. Best emo album. I am going to change my vote quick to Origami Angel Summer City. <laughs> <laughs> Just because, like, the more I think about it, it's like, that is the most, like, wall-to-wall best emo album, in my opinion. I'm actually worried, because I've, I've been considering Cosmic Thrill Seekers, like, definitely the hit for 2019 for, like, when we do that vote. But, shit, I think Gami might actually win, which, ooh, fuck, when are we going to have Prince Daddy on? <laughs> <laughs> You know, yeah, I I honestly would say somewhere city too. Just like Max Seal would have been a close one, but um, I, I just feel like Gami just grew so much and blew up so much, and uh, it's just like such a well put together record. I guess Gami doesn't need my vote, so I'm gonna go with uh, short fiction's fate's worse than death. Um, best new emo artist. I personally found this one kind of tough because new to me means they have to like put out their first release in. 2019 and i think like I, I was like going through the freshman class and i was like well a lot of those bands were on like their first thing in 2018 i think out of the freshman class like the true 2019 freshman to me would probably be guitar fight from fully cooley and i was i was gonna i was gonna say that i think you know i i 
didn't really like their record, but like I think they actually have some of the most promise of that crop of bands. Like I can see the seeds. I feel like they're going to be really good. Mm-hmm. I think I'd say I'd probably say Jail Socks, just because like Jail Socks had some music out before, but it was like only like two songs. Like it wasn't yeah. very much. So I just feel like this EP made it like a lot more solid. Like because a lot of bands I feel like put out like a couple songs and then just don't do shit and they're kind of a fuck off band, but. Jail Socks got to that point where they're like a solid band that's actually going to do really cool shit. So I think that was, that'd probably be my pick. I honestly had the same mindset where I was like, well, fuck, I'm just going to put Jail Socks. But I think like that's my honorary vote goes to Jail Socks because like I really love the EP that they put out. Um, and like a, their, their like live show was like, Honestly, I'm not just saying it because you hear, like, made me think of the first time I saw Stars Hollow, where it was, like, quick and I wanted more and, like, just very explosive. Um, I had the same reaction to seeing them this year. Hell yeah. Fuck y'all, I'm sticking to Guitar Fight. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Best emo band to break up. I gotta give it to Forrest, who have not been mentioned this year um, on this podcast yet, y'all. But yeah, uh, that sucked to have them put out like the best like mathy emo album of the year and then break up in the same year but doing the american football thing i guess yeah oh shit didn't the american didn't the american football record come out this year yeah that's like an honorable honorable mention for me i guess (laughs) honorable honorable runner up to honorable (laughs) (laughs) what do y'all think for best emo band to break up I'd agree, Forrest. Like, I can't really think of anything else where I was, like, bummed, but they're a band. When I saw they broke up, I was like, oh, man. Uh, I'm going to go with Me Without You. Oh, fuck. Oh, my God. God damn. Holy shit. shit. It doesn't... Yeah, that's That one doesn't feel real yet, because they're teasing stuff. Right, 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 right. But, like, they're... They broke up. They announced their breakup. I know. (laughs) Yeah, it's a heavy one. All right. Best emo song, Fox by Dogleg. It's unreal. It doesn't have a chorus. It doesn't even have a fucking chorus. I Kennedy by Shingard. Oh, good one. I'm saying Love Handles by Nice. That song <laughs> gets me going. Um, best emo label. I kind of left this one blank, and then I put Triple Crown question mark because I like what they're doing. Like they're still releasing like the big dogs, but they're taking in like the right new bands. And I think elevating them and like, I don't, it doesn't feel as like skeezy as like, oh no, I don't want to say skeezy, but like Pure Noise seems to just be gobbling up everything that's like yeah. remotely popular and heavy. And I kind of see Triple Crown like building bands in the best way possible. And I yeah. respect yeah. that a lot. I'd agree with oh, that. Along the same lines of, like, not quite skeezy, but definitely gobbling shit up, no sleep, you know? Like, Whoa. they just scooped up Worst Party Ever, which I feel like that's, like, a little bit of, like, an opportunistic signing. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? I... I'm gonna bifurcate my choice for Best Emo Label into Best Screamo Label and Best Emo Label, because the Best Screamo Label is fucking clearly Middleman Records. Um, and the best emo label is clearly Chatterbot Records. That's, yep, yeah, I, yeah. I, have, I have Chatterbot and Triple Crown down. Yeah, Lex just really fucking cares. Like, yeah. Like, a lot. 100%. It, like, it, I, it's so obvious, like, in everything that, that she yeah. does. I can't, I can't even imagine caring as much about anything the way that she's capable of caring about everything. Like, involving <laughs> that label. It, it can it shows a lot with Gami especially just like because Lex also manages Gami and uh, was just a big driving force behind like that whole release idea and just like the way that it was rolled out yeah just like incredible caring person and Triple Crown just like I think does it right you know like for the size that they are and Chatterbot does it like passionately so I can respect both of them a lot. Mm-hmm. also Triple Crown. Like, everyone seems to be very happy with Triple Crown, and that's kind of rare for a record label. Yeah. It's so, very true. Whatever's going on there, keep it up. So the best REMO post. I dug. I had to dig. And I remember seeing this one when it came out, and it still makes me laugh. So um, someone, 
was at American Football Show, and the title of the post says, Someone airdropped this to me at the American Football F- Show in Denver. And it is Hey Arnold's house with American Football. Uh, <laughs> oh, wait, no. It says American Football head on it. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but that's just really the fact good. that you're at a show and someone airdropped it to you is fucking tight. I want someone to do that to me at the show. That's really dope. I think I agree with that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I can't. I can't really think of any that came out this that were posted this year that I was like floored by. Like, I think the person that played never meant on two guitars at the same time. Like, I think that was last year, but um, I don't think whenever I stuck s- out. Whenever I see that post pop up, I just hope that person is okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, how fucking sad do you have to be to like do that? <laughs> both parts and then to learn each on an individual hand and then to record it and then to be like oh this this emo subreddit needs to see this yeah you know? yeah side note is our emo dying it's in a it's in a little bit of a fucked up place right now i think once the hype for the mcr reunion <laughs> dies down it might go back to normal <laughs> <laughs> because so, that's that just has kind of like drawn like flies a whole bunch of people who just don't fucking get it <laughs> is is our email just all kind of moving to twitter or something like yes yes all the, like the big personalities and like the like the social interaction that was happening on our emo is now on twitter because everyone figured out that that's where everything was happening anyway for example that's where we are uh <laughs> and <laughs> Uh, it's just weird. The tones, the tones shifted, um, you know, and it goes back and forth. Like, you know, when, uh, uh, snowing announced, oh shit, one of their members came out as trans that got a whole bunch of, you know, that got, that got a whole bunch of traction and people were really positive about it. And then, you know, just the other day I saw someone say something like, Hey, I feel like the reason emo trap gets shit on all the time is, because you know it's a it's a a genre primarily made by people of color, and y'all should you know maybe take a step back and consider it. And it just got massively downvoted, and people were like literally calling the person who said it like retarded in the comments. And it's just weird. Like there's there's no tonal consistency anymore. Yeah, yeah, that that seems true. And I think like. A big part, too, is, like, the demographic shift of just, like, who is into the emo kind of emo that's popular now. Like, the people that listen to Origami Angel definitely are not the same kind of people that listen to, like, I don't know, not, like, Algernon anymore. There used to be some crossover, but, like, now it's, like, a lot of kids who right. listen to Gami or, like, <laughs> Nice or anything. Those are people who, like... Roddy, <laughs> Roddy from Nice literally said he just doesn't listen to 90s emo. That blew yeah. my mind. <laughs> we, we talked about that on tour, actually, because we both talked about how much we don't like Braid or Mineral. And just, I, I mean, I probably shouldn't say it on here either, but yeah, we both were like, yeah, I fucking hate those bands. <laughs> like, I, like, I just rest, like... Rest assured, I am seething right now. Um, <laughs> and that's fine. But, I mean, me and Roddy, like, disagree, because he doesn't like snowing at all. And I like... Oh, that's right. And I ride really hard for snowing, and like they're one of the only bands where like I say that I don't give a shit that their record sounds like shit because it almost like makes it better in my brain somehow. But uh, I, I agree on the '90s emo thing; not a fan. But it's but ultimate point being, yeah, I feel like the demographic has shifted a little, and that demographic that's really involved in emo is like more partial to Twitter now, just being like younger kids, you know? Yeah. But, but now with, like, the weird insularity of Twitter, like, I feel like people are not having their opinions, like, checked. So they'll just say, like, the most fucking out-of-pocket shit. And no one has any frame of reference for, like, anything otherwise. So they just kind of let it slide. Um, I don't yeah, mean in a social fair. sense. I mean, in, I, I mean in, like, a music take sense. Like, some yeah. of the wackest fucking takes on twitter <laughs> like because there's not yeah. a crock in to pop up in your mentions to say like that was fucking exactly. stupid exactly exactly <laughs> okay i have to go in about 30 minutes so that's we can wrap yeah so best art emo mod i'm going to say ellie and hobo because it seems like both of you two are actually actively doing things i mean i'm actively doing things but hobo is the one who's actually like uh monitoring the subreddit yeah. uh so i'm gonna i'm gonna go with him 
<laughs> yeah, I'd say I'd say the same. Um, Hobo stuck up for me on our emo one time because like I posted a, some leftover Stars Hollow merch because we were trying to get money to fund our record, and uh, some people were like saying like this isn't like an advertisement subreddit. Fuck you! Like stop posting this shit. And, okay, but like literally, yes, it is. Yeah, sorry. That's, well, that's the thing. That's what <laughs> Hobo posted, and I was like, "You guys are being so dumb. Like, this is literally the same as someone posting their band's music. Like, there's nothing like bad about this. If you don't like it, just ignore it." And I like when it comes to situations like that, I like need someone to like stick up for me because I'm like, "Shit, am I being like a fucking predatory asshole trying to get people to buy shit? Like, is this like the wrong thing to do?" So that like made me feel a lot better. And so I am indebted for that reason. I, I will say not to toot my own horn, but I do think I like contribute to d- discussions more so than Hobo does. Hobo does a lot of like the technical work. And then I try and do upkeep like with conversations. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. Me and Gavin just yeah. talked the other day about a thread that you commented on, just kind of like explaining to someone like the current like state of DIY emo and just like how like well thought out, well written that was. So I'd agree. Oh, was was that the one where the dude was like, the, all of this shit is fake emo, and like, I needed to like sit him down and explain why being angry was like detrimental to his mental health. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure that was it. Yeah, <laughs> that was fun. Wait, was that the one that you texted me the response to? Yes, <laughs> it was a good one. That was good. Um, best non emo artist, 100 gex. 100 gex. Billy Eilish, but you know, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. Uh, best non emo album, I think, Thousand Gex. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, my, my top two were like non emo albums, so I'd say Ginger and When We All Fall Asleep. Those are two solid ones. Best non emo song. Oh, shit. I left that blank. And I left the second to last one blank. Um,. Should I say Stupid Horse by 100 Gex? You can. <laughs> I'm going to say Ringtone. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Damn, I'm just like the odd one out on all these. Uh, Sugar by Brock Hampton <laughs> is sick. But, you know, 100 Gex, pretty cool too, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Best non-emo label. I'm not going to give it to uh, Mad Decent, who put out 100 Gex. Um, <laughs> who did I put? Who did I buy records from this year? I liked a lot of Death Wishes signings, and they were putting out some records from smaller bands and stuff this year. So, Death Wish. Oh shit! Honorable mention: State State Falls Clairvoyant. <laughs> oh, oh shit! God yeah, damn it! Great fucking record. God damn it! <laughs> uh, sorry, I'm sh- shouting you out so late, but yeah, Death Wish. <laughs> yeah, I'd say Death Wish too. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. So that is all 2019, except for our personal lives. Y'all, how were your 2019s? Mine was solid in a lot of ways. I met my girlfriend. Well, like, we knew each other in high school, but we never talked. But, like, we, like, reconnected and started dating. And she's, like, insanely good to me. And makes me feel very secure which is something i haven't felt in a long time i have a new position at work where i'm like a supervisor for like a whole um i have like a caseload of like 50 kids and 50 employees at like a human service um organization for kids with special needs so that's been pretty cool we went on two really cool tours uh with nice and gami and like those are two band two of the only bands that i really care to tour with and we got to do that uh, we put out Tadpole, which like hit a hundred thousand streams before the year was over, which is really really cool. Um, yeah, yeah, it's just a cool year. It was like really weird in the sense that like my kind of um, thought process and feelings about my involvement in DIY music have kind of shifted, and I think I'm like getting to that point where I'm leaning more toward being like a normal adult, um, <laughs> which is like sad. And it's like that, and that's, but that's just kind of how things are going. And especially after wrecking my van on tour, I just kind of like sat down and had like a come to Jesus talk with myself where I was like, you know, like what is important to you right now? 
and what are you doing for yourself versus just because you think it's what you have to do. So yeah, that was kind of, that's like been the big theme of 2019 is just kind of wrestling with those thoughts of like, am I just doing something because it's what I've always done or am I doing it because I love it? But yeah, otherwise a pretty good year. No true complaints. So nice. Uh, uh, This was a really big year for me, like just in terms of uh, where, where like my internet shit was taking me. Like I got published on the hard times and my blog did fucking Iron Man numbers, and now I have like a now I have a Patreon, and I feel like I I have a direction in life that uh, I I couldn't really say about myself this time last year. Um, also, this time last year, uh, I said that me and Dina were getting engaged, and uh, this is kind of a repeat of that announcement, but it's like an official like public engagement and you know we uh we went in on a really pretty ring and we're gonna do like a uh like a really romantic proposal and i'm pretty stoked on that um and i'm just uh i'm pretty stoked last year i feel like i made a lot of friends in diy this year i feel like i just kind of strengthened those bonds that i already created and i'm looking forward to 2020 um and it's rare that i in my life that I look forward to a year, but I'm actually pretty stoked. I'm in a good place. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Fuck yeah. I think a lot of big things happened to me this year, and I think it all equals out to like being on the up. Uh, one of my bands went on like a 10 day tour, something that I've always wanted to do. And it was a really good tour. We didn't have like a single like dud of a show, and one band broke up, but we also put out a full length. Um, that was something I'd always wanted to be involved with. And like, we put it out on like, like a label that did tapes for us. They got a premiere on the gray estates, which is like where a lot of my favorite albums have premiered. So that was cool. Um, the E word did gigantic things like fuck. That's fucking true. Like I was going to wait till later to talk about this, but holy fuck. Yeah. I mean, (laughs) snowing tank. Uh, Christian Holden asked to be on our podcast. Yeah, no, uh, the, the hotel year, the hotel year episodes were like two of my favorite things I've like ever listened to in podcasts. It was just so thorough and so like good to listen to. It was mm-hmm. so cool. Hey, sure. Thank you. Yeah, and we're gonna have two thousand followers on Twitter at some point. Like, damn, yeah, like, like, like soon, soon. Uh, I moved in with. My girlfriend, I moved out of the apartment I've lived at for three years. Tyler stayed at it. Um, yeah. I uh, took a shower without the shower curtain. I had to be did very that. careful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I took everything out, even the shower curtain. Um, <laughs> that's funny. Uh, uh, I went to the West Coast for the first time. I went to Seattle. That was pretty cool. And, you know, I, I think emotionally things were all right. I got pissed off and stopped looking at the internet for like months at a time and that's good to me and I think I should do that more. Get pissed off? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so I guess, how is 2020 looking for everyone? What do you want to do in 2020? Um, I'm really stoked to tour, tour Japan. That's like big bucket list thing. I'm just excited to do that and like just like appreciate it for what it is and just like see a new place that's not like I don't know, just when we tour now, it's like I've seen everywhere, so we just don't really explore. We don't do anything really, like, touristy. We just kind of show up to the show and call it a day. But, like, the drives in Japan aren't going to be that long, so we'll have time to, like, explore. And we'll have Kaiseki with us, who is from Japan. Um, So I'm really excited about that. Um, I've started kind of, like, looking into grad school a little bit. Oh, shit. Good luck. Holy fuck. I've, uh, I've wanted to do it for a long time i'm like really good at school that's like one of the only (laughs) things that i will ever admit that i'm good at is school like i graduated with a really good gpa and just like took it very seriously and just kind of at a point where i'm like since i work in like a human service field you just don't like make shit for money with just a bachelor's degree um and i want to continue to like do things to help people but i want to do it at a more influential level and at a level where i can like support you know, a family or like, you know, people I care about. And I don't really like, I'm really excited to put out our record. I think it's going to be like 
the best thing, best collection of songs that I've ever had part in writing. I think it's going to mean a lot to me, and that's all that really matters. But I think that people who like Stars Hollow, I think it'll mean a lot to them, too. And I'm just excited to see that reaction. Um, and then I'm excited to just kind of, like, be in a position where we can just, like, see what happens and decide from there what to do with ourselves. It's just to the point where, like, I don't feel like I have to grind anymore. I feel like I can release something, be proud of it, and do what I need to do beyond that point. Because if I start grad school, you know, like, that's going to take up a lot of time. So I'm just excited to kind of, like, feel things out and do things for me and uh, still put out really great art while I'm at it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I am really excited to uh, start doing YouTube. Uh, I feel like that is really close on the horizon for me. And uh, if not become fully self-employed, maybe be able to just uh, get by on that and, like, my smoothie job right now or, like, swing a couple shifts a week at, like, a skate shop, you know. Just uh, just take it easy and grind on, you know, the shit that I, that I really, really care about. And I feel like I can, like, finally say, like, what that is, you know? I, I, I feel like less this year, but I was, like, kind of, like, obsessive about, like, finding new music and stuff. And I just want to, like, disconnect more and, like, I want to, like, I feel like I want to be, like, on, a, on an Ellie level of knowledge about emo. Cause like emo oh, is like shit. because because like emo is like the music that like I I through and through care about like the most and like I want to be on your your level of like being able to point at something like that is this and this and this you know what I mean yeah yeah that um, makes sense that's that's a fucking massive compliment holy <laughs> shit thank you <laughs> well it's either like you or Tom uh, from Washed Up Emo yeah. Uh, I want to be on Axe to Grind in 2020. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but, yeah, I guess I also want to get better at playing bass as well. Like, and then, like not in, like, I want to, like, be able to play shit like Flea. I just want to write, like, very, very melodic bass lines. And I don't know where to start. Like, I... like I don't know, like, who to rip off. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I want to learn bass, uh, but basses are expensive for me because I'm poor as shit. Craig's that so. Yeah. Or, I mean, like, when Stars first started, our first bassist had, like, a Squire jazz bass that was, like, $150, and that's, like, all that he ripped on for, like, two years, you know? Which, 150 is not, like, cheap, cheap, but, you know, like, that's, like, a good good price to start learning how to do something super sick you know and, or, and like the other thing about like playing in diy bands ellie is you don't have to show up with your own equipment you can just be the asshole to be like yo you guys gonna bring your bass amp tight <laughs> that's <laughs> true as hell god that was like the coolest thing about this tour with nice because sage was drumming for both of us and sage just did not want to use the drum kit that he brought so he would just like <laughs> every show would find a way to use someone else's drum kit and it was just so sick it was like an art form watching it yeah i was gonna say that sounds like a fucking bit and it's great <laughs> it was great i loved it he he would just go to any length to not have to load his drum kit in and it was just amazing but that shows how cool the diy scene can be because like i think we only had to use his drum kit like three or four times so that's pretty sick good. yeah that's good oh yeah all right, y'all. I got to get in my car and be somewhere at 8.45, and I've got five minutes to be there. So, <laughs> all right. Well, thank you right. for having me on again. I do always appreciate the uh, the opportunity and attention mm -hmm. and time I mean, to speak. So. Consider you permanent third mic on, like, end of your wrap-ups. That's great. I'm like the Jeremy Bolm of <laughs> yeah. whatever. Yeah, yeah, yes, mm -hmm. that is. I'll take it. Hell yeah. All right. Yeah. Ellie, talk to you soon. Tyler, hope to see you soon. Yes, we're we're playing before we go to Japan. So if oh, you're really able to drive to, yeah, we're gonna play. So nice. If you uh, if you feel like making the trip, I'll see you then.